Third Court for the Judicial District of Stanford. When the transaction of criminal business is now open in session, the Honorable Judge Randolph presiding. Good morning, Your Honor. Good morning. Please be seated. Thank you. Court discussed with counsel this morning the final draft of the jury instructions, and that final draft with correction should be made to counsel uh, after the arguments today. Are we ready to proceed? Yes, sir. We can bring the jury in, please. Counsel, stipulate, please. Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. The court will explain how the proceeding will be scheduled today. Today is scheduled for closing arguments. Each side will have one hour to present their closing arguments. The state will have one hour. However, the state will have an opportunity to divide its argument into two parts. So the state will argue first, then the defense. The defense will have no second opportunity to argue, and the state may then uh, close its argument. Are the parties ready to proceed? Yes, Your Honor. Attorney Manning. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I just want to start by saying thank you. Thank you for your time and attention over the past six weeks. I have an opportunity to speak to you now, and then the defense will go, and then Attorney McGinnis will speak with you one last time. Then our job is done, and yours begins. I'm going to start by talking about one thing that the evidence shows. Jennifer is dead. Let's be very clear. She was murdered on May 24th, 2019. There's blood spatter throughout the garage, throughout the undercarriage of two cars, footprints and swipes of blood. Her blood soaked shirt and bra thrown out in the garbage on the streets of Albany Avenue, along with zip ties, sponges, and duct tape. Make no mistake, this was a deliberate intentional murder. The evidence of Fotos Dulos taking his employee's car at 5.35 in the morning, driving down the parkway, secreting it at Waveney Park, and riding a bike to lay in wait for Jennifer. He did those acts because he planned to hurt, assault, to restrain her movements, and to kill her. Jennifer did not run away from her family, her friends, her five children, as the defense would like you to believe. She did not run away from her family, leaving her blood soaked bra and shirt. She didn't hide in Waveney, head towards the train tracks. You heard the defense questions throughout the trial about that. Or try to make a call or get service with an old phone at Waveney Park in the afternoon on the 24th. The defense would have you believe she ran away from her kids, but she did not. Jennifer is dead, and Fotis and Michelle Traconis intended that to happen. They agreed to work together to make it happen, and unfortunately, they were successful in making it happen. But they got caught. This trial is very simple. It's about a conspiracy and about a cover-up. It's about Michelle Traconis' actions and about how she and Fotos Dulos conspired together to murder the woman who was standing in their way. 
It's about the frustration of Photos Duelist not seeing his kids for over a year and a half, about having, well, not seeing his kids and having a supervisor present for a year and a half. And every time those kids came around, Michelle Traconis had to leave her home. She had to take her daughter somewhere else. And we know she was sick of it. The frustration turned to anger and hatred. Listen to her own words in the interviews. How she describes Jennifer, someone she has never met. She describes her as manipulating, angry, toxic. And we all remember the comment to Pavel, that bitch should be buried next to the dog. As you heard Mike Mean and Mike Rose's testimony, each attorney tried to tell her there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Because we know what she thought about the two years of the custody case, about the two years of court hearings. She described it as two years of torture, that it was a nightmare, and that she was going to leave. But that light at the end of the tunnel, I submit to you, wasn't another court hearing, because there was a court hearing, and nothing changed. As of Wednesday, May 22nd, Photos Dulo still had to have a supervisor present. Nothing changed. So they were going to make it change. After all, why would they be toasting at a dinner party on May 23rd? If, why were they happy, excited, if nothing had changed? Because they were going to make it change the next morning. The defendant and Photos Dulos conspired together to commit the crime of murder of Jennifer Dulos. That is count one. The elements that comprise the charge of murder are in agreement that the defendant specifically intended to agree with Lotus Dulos, and that agreement was to engage in conduct that, cons that constituted the crime of murder. That's intent to kill and do kill. That there was an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. Why did we spend so much time on Lotus Dulos the past six weeks? Because that's an overt act. And there's an intent requirement. The defendant had the intent to commit the crime of murder. So how do you know somebody's intentions? How do you know their motive? You look at what they do. You infer their motive, their intentions from their behavior. Look at what she did. Look at what Michelle Traponis did. Her acts, her behavior during the time of the murder. Look at what she did, her acts and behavior before and after the murder. Look at when she did these acts. Look at what she said. Look at what she didn't say. And look at what she lied about. Now, the plan started on that Wednesday, May 22nd, when Photos Dulos arrived an hour early. This is the person who Stefan Reich said had his own Photos time. And then on Thursday, May 22nd, 2019, before the dinner party, remember when is important as well. Remember Pavel Gomini's testimony that Photos Dulos told him he had to drop the car off at 80 Mountain Spring Road, the Toyota Tacoma, right? This, I submit to you, was, a, was in order for him to be able to leave early the next morning, and nobody would know. After drop-off, Photos goes to the grocery store to get more meat. Remember that testimony? But what does he do while he's there? He sets up the alibi call. His good friend, Andreas Tucciardis, his good friend who coincidentally does not cooperate with the police. Why do you think he doesn't cooperate? Look at the timing, the text message that was set up. It was done at 5.53 after he had already moved the car. And it says, call me. The defendant, and Photos Dulos have their dinner party. Hutch Haynes, his wife, the Reichs, there's a celebration, a toast to the light at the end of the tunnel, but they had already moved the car and they had already set up the text message. So what were they toasting? Well, they were toasting what they were gonna do the next morning. After the Reichs left and the Haynes left, what happened? The defendant and Photos Dulos solidified their plan at around 10 o'clock in the evening, they texted again. Photos Dulos texted his good friend from Greece, specifying the time, 3.30 yours, which is 8.30 in 
and Connecticut time. <coughs> Just enough time for Michelle Traconis to drop her daughter off at school and return to Fort Jefferson Crossing to answer the call the next day. A call she knew what time it was coming. Is it just coincidence that she happened to be in the office at the exact moment that Photosuros told Andreas Tuchiardis to call him? Or is it reasonable, based on the motive and based on the evidence, that she knew what time that call was coming and she made sure to answer it? Now, early the next morning at 5.35 in the Otis Doulis leaves 80 Mountain Road, and he drives to New Canaan and his employees to Toyota Tacoma with a bike in the back of the truck. And he leaves his phone with Michelle Traconis. This is all evidence of Photos Doulos and the defendant's intent to murder Jennifer. And that murder is the overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. But Photos Doulos needed help to commit that murder. He needed an alibi. He needed the defendant. So what is the defendant doing while Fotis Dulos is driving down to New Canaan when he's southbound on the Merritt Parkway at the Fairfield Rest Area at 636 or at the New Canaan Rest Area at 703? What about when he's riding a bike up Weed Street, the direct path between Waveney Park and 69 Wells Lane? Or at 7.57 when the school bus camera captures that Toyota Tacoma secreted in a cutout across from Waveney Park. Or at 8.05 when Jennifer returns home after dropping her children off the last time they will see their mother. What is the defendant doing while Jennifer is being assaulted and killed in the garage of 69 Wells Lane. Photos Dulles is a overt act. Remember, Michelle Traconis doesn't have to be a 69 Wells Lane. She is not charged with the murder. She is charged with conspiracy to commit the murder. It's Photos Dulos who committed that overt act. Remember Mark Davison's testimony? There were a minimum of two impacts. This wasn't a fall where she hit her head. You saw the blood splatter on the car, on the undercarriage of two cars, the garage floor, the garbage cans. You can make the reasonable inference that this was an anger-driven assault on Jennifer, and she died as a result. Then there's the cover-up, the cleanup in the garage, the swipes, the paper towels that were missing <coughs> that Lauren Almeida put out the next the day before, the bucket that was missing from the garage. And don't forget the DNA on the faucet. Recall Matt Riley and Kristen Medell's testimony. Matt Riley took a swab off of that faucet because there was a blood-like stain that in his training experience he determined was evidentiary. And he took a swab from that blood-like stain and it contained Jennifer and Photostulos' DNA 4.3 times, 4.3 billion times more likely to occur. Recall Kristen Medell's testimony on that. Did that blood like stain? Well, let me ask you this. Did that blood like stain with Photostulos' DNA come from a cake two days before? Or is it more likely that he missed a spot? After he is done cleaning up the garage at 1025, Photos drives the suburban away from 69 Wells Lane. At 10.30, it's in the same direction en route back to Waveney Park, where it is later found by New Canaan PD with the battery dead and the car in reverse. Drives back the Merritt Parkway. Remember Trooper LeBeau's testimony? You make the call. It's your opinion, your memory that controls. But I submit to you, this is a bike in the back of this truck. And don't forget the Tour de France imprint on the tape that was found out of Harper. During this entire morning, Photos Dulos doesn't have his phone on him. Why wouldn't he want his phone on him? Well, there's two reasons. One, he doesn't want his location tracked. I think that's a reasonable inference you can make. But two, he needs somebody to manipulate it. 
He needs somebody to manipulate it at four Jefferson crossings. So it looks like he is home. So it looks like he's taking a shower. So it looks like he is in the office. So it looks like he is answering calls. We all know who that someone is. Michelle Traconis. Look at all the text messages that were not answered that morning and all the phone calls that were not answered except for one, a planned one. Make no mistake, she knew exactly what she was doing when she answered that phone. How do you know? It was planned, the timing, but also she doesn't talk about the call at all in her first two interviews. After all, the call is not on her alibi script and make no mistake, we call them timelines, but they are alibi scripts. That call is not on her alibi script. A lot of other calls are, but conveniently that one's not on. It's on Fotis's. After all, it's supposed to be his alibi. Are all those things consistent with the defense's theory that she didn't know anything? I submit to you, they're consistent with one thing, her guilt. By the way, at 1025, when Fotos Dulos is driving Jennifer Suburban to Waveney Park, Fotos' good friend, the one who called at 826, coincidentally, sends this me. Choices. A, you can spend the rest of your life with your wife. <laughs> Why is he sending that meme at that time? Coincidence? Or does that just show the intent behind that 826 phone call? User manipulation. Mike Clark testified that when somebody manipulates the phone, they turn it, they unlock it, it gets recorded. Now, the only person who could have reasonably manipulated Fotis Dulles' phone that morning is Michelle Traconis. There is some evidence of Kent Mawinney. He came to the office at 721 and 841. But the phone was manipulated before 721, before he arrives, and it was manipulated after he leaves. The defendant is the only person who could have reasonably manipulated that phone and the only person who had reason to manipulate that phone. At 644, the phone is unlocked. 645, 646, it's turned. Orient orientation change, 701. 701, the phone is unlocked again. 807, unlocked again. All this while he is en route on the in the Toyota Tacoma and on the bike and in the garage. At 826, she answers the call and puts it on speakerphone. At 831, it's unlocked again. And at 903, after Kat Mawinney leaves, it's unlocked again. This is the conspiracy. Now I wanna talk about the cover up. There are multiple charges, but as I said, this is simple. It is all connected because the acts and behaviors of what she did what Michelle Traconis does before, during, after, and the statements, the omissions, and the lies are all what we call circumstantial evidence. And they're all circumstantial evidence for each and every charge. After all, you don't shake hands and find a murder somebody at a dinner party. Look at the cleanup between 1222, when the Toyota Tacoma returns, in 710 prior to driving to Albany Avenue. These acts go hand in hand with counts one, two, and three. The Toyota returns at 1222, and then the defendant and Photos Dulos both go to 80 Mountain Spring at approximately 135. And from 135 until 458, when Pavel Gomini shows up, Photos Dulos never leaves 80 Mountain Spring Road. For three and a half hours, he never leaves an empty property. It is reasonable to assume that he needs that amount of time to clean the Tacoma and to prepare the garbage bags for Harper. Michelle Tracona submits in her own interviews that she went back and forth to 80 Mountain from Fort Jefferson Crossing that afternoon, but she says she only did it two to three times, depending on which interview you watch. But look at her interviews. She omits and lies about things 
only when they're incriminating. There were five trips that day, not two to three. Trip one, 136 to 141. She stays at Edie Mountain Spring Road for five minutes before returning to Fort Jefferson Crossing. Trip number two, 201 to 224. She returns to Edie Mountain Road, stays for 23 minutes before returning to Fort Jefferson Crossing. And trip number three, at 355 to 404, she stays for nine minutes. What is she doing between trips two and three? Between 224 and 355 when she is alone at Fort Jefferson Crossing. She's burning something. Then she's not burning something. And then she's burning something again. Remember, there were three separate fire events, ladies and gentlemen, this is two of them. And she is alone at Fort Jefferson Crossing while the fire is going on. How do we know that she's alone? We don't see any other cars leave 80 Mountain Spring Road. Her own admission in her interviews for driving the Jeep in the Suburban and photos to his phone location. Mike Clark's testimony, it stays at 80 Mountain Spring Road during the time of those fires. Now we go to trip four. Michelle Tricones goes back to 80 Mountain Road. She stays for 35 minutes between 423 and 458 when Pavel Gomini shows up. Then Pavel Gomini leaves, Michelle Tricones backs out of the driveway and photos to leave. They all leave together. And at this moment, she takes the keys to the Toyota Tacoma to prevent Pavel from taking the car for the weekend. After all, they need more time. They haven't gone to the car wash yet. Look at her alibi script. Look at her interviews about what she says and doesn't say about the keys. But Pavel's insistent he wants his truck for the weekend. He wants that motorbike. So she has to return the keys. And she stays for four minutes to return the keys. And she goes back to Fort Jefferson Crossing and we have a fire event. These acts, including her statements, are all circumstantial evidence of her agreement to conspire with Fotos Dulos to murder Jennifer and to tamper with evidence and being an accessory to tampering with evidence. When I talk about tampering, I'm going to, I'm going to combine <coughs> counts two, three, four, and five. Counts two and three have to do with May 24th and the events at Albany Avenue. And counts four and five have to do with the Tacoma and Russell Speeders on May 29th. The elements the state has to prove for conspiracy to commit tampering is the agreement and agreement with photos duos to commit the crime of tampering. Tampering itself is knowing a criminal investigation is pending, and I submit to you that it is a reasonable inference a criminal investigation is going to commence when you commit a crime like murder. And that evidence was tampered with in counts two and three. That is very simple. That's all the items that came out of Albany Avenue. Jennifer's bra, her shirt, the zip ties. And for counts three, four, and five, that's the Toyota Tacoma. There has to be an intent to deceive. And there is a clear intent to deceive, to destroy evidence when you throw it in a garbage can on Albany Avenue, or when you take the vehicle you use to commit the crime to a car wash and ask for two extra details on the interior. The overt act, well, here, straightforward, the defendant traveled with photos to Lewis to Hartford to dispose of the evidence, and you specifically intend to enter that agreement and commit the crime of tampering. She's also charged with being an accessory to tampering. Accessory requires simply that you intentionally aid Fotis Dulos in tampering with the evidence. This is both for Hartford and Russell Speeders. And what did the defendant and Fotis Dulos do next? It's all very clear. It's on video. A C4. Please watch the C4 videos again. I'm not giving enough time to show them to you, uh, but I am going to draw your attention to one of those videos. 
specifically the Albany and Blue Hills camera. It's also on Adam Street at around 748. When you watch this video, notice the simultaneous actions of Photos Dulos and Michelle Draconis. The coordination that after they have been sitting there a while, they open the door at the exact same time. Conveniently, at the right time to block the view from the tan car waiting to exit the parking lot. After we all, after, after all, we know what's in that story. It's a license plate, the altered license plates. And it is reasonable to assume that the defendant, Michelle Traconis, did not want anyone from that tan car to see what, what they were doing. They didn't want a witness. What does she do next? At this exact moment, she opens her door. Well, she says it in her interviews. She wipes gum off of her hands onto the city sidewalk. Is that reasonable? Or is it more reasonable that they didn't want anybody in the tan car to see photos to dispose of those altered license plates in the sewer? Coordination, conspiracy, and intentionally aiding. After all, who uses the city sidewalk to wipe their hands? As for the evidence that was tampered with, you have them. The license plate, the bloody ponchos, the gloves, the tool, the bloody towel, the mop, the zip ties that were cut, and her shirt and her bra sliced down the middle. Don't forget the bag, the bag that contained the defendant's DNA on the opening. That bag also contained blood-like stains and duct tape. And that duct tape had Jennifer's DNA on the sticky side of it. That, the defendant's DNA on that bag shows her knowledge and her lies. It proves she's an accessory to tampering. Now the defendant would have you believe she knew nothing of Fotis Doulos' acts. But look at the context. The police knock on her door that night, May 24th, 2019, when her daughter is not home. The police want to talk about her boyfriend being missing and they are, her boyfriend's wife being missing. And they are in the middle of a contentious divorce and custody battle. If she, were, if she didn't know anything, why would she hide in the bedroom? She wasn't hiding from the police that night. She was hiding from the truth. Is it more reasonable the next day at the hairdresser when she was happy and excited that she was happy and excited because she thought for a brief moment they got away with it? Or is it, well, then what happens? Photos Julius's phone gets taken. He can't get the kids that weekend. The plans they set in place, they start to crumble. She knew what was going on, ladies and gentlemen. Do you remember her joke in the interview? She made a joke about the fact that she said maybe she can have sex with Fotis while she's in jail or he's in jail. Watch the interviews again. Now, this is all before May 29th, before Russell Speeders. And this is the last count hindering prosecution where the state must prove, and we have proven, that she provided assistance to Fotis Dulos with intent to prevent, hinder, and delay and discover the crime the charge of murder. She assisted by providing transportation to him and other means. This is all about the Toyota Tacoma. Remember Pavel's testimony, how he hasn't spoken to Jennifer Dulos in years, and yet her DNA was on a blood-like stain that Matt Riley found on the seats. <laughs> And remember Kristen Medell's testimony on how easily DNA can be destroyed with just wiping, let alone the cleaning solutions that they use at Russell's feeders. The defendant provided assistance and aid to Photos Dulos on May 29, 2019. She followed him to Russell's feeders that day in her rented Yukon. Photos Dulos put down her phone number and they left the car wash together. The defendant got the call that the car was ready and she went back and went to the bank with him to pick up cash to pay for it. And she was with him to pick up the car. 
the evidence proves beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant intended to end her and Photos Doulos' two years of torture by murdering Jennifer Barbara Doulos. She acted as his alibi during the murder. She conspired to tamper with the physical evidence of the murder, intentionally aided in covering it up at 80 Mountain Spring Road, at Albany Avenue in Hartford, and at Russell Speeders in Avon. The evidence shows the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of each and every count. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. This is the one and only time, except during voir dire, that I get to speak to you during this trial. It's been a long trial, and I will just echo what Ms. Manning said about your dedication and your uh, attention to this case over what has been, at least in recent years, one of the longer trials that has taken place in the state of Connecticut. I am going to um, refer to notes while I'm talking. Usually I just try to talk and I have pointers, but because there are so many things that happened in this case, there's just been so much over the course of the last six, six and a half weeks, I may refer more to the notes than I normally would. And I apologize in advance if it looks like I'm reading from uh, a paper rather than just talking to you. What I want to start off by pointing out is that what really happened on May 24th, 2019? Because whatever was going on that day, whatever Fotis Doulos' role was, in the disappearance, and we'll, I'll say the likely death of, of Jennifer Dulos, Michelle Traconis did not know. She did not know that Fotis Dulos planned to harm her. Everything suggested that things were going well, and it was to the contrary. In fact, she didn't know that Fotis was capable of doing something like this. A man who was dedicated to his five children, had been in court for years trying to get custody back. The state has made what I would suggest are unfounded and unfair assumptions and has speculated that Michelle Traconis had to know what was going on, that she was, because she was romantically linked with Fotis, that she was somehow involved in this nefarious, murderous plot. But, but that's not reality. That's more like one of these cable TV movies, scripted movies. It's not based on the facts that you heard during this trial. It is, and I will say this multiple times, speculation. It's conjecture. It's guesswork, which is not the standard of evidence in a criminal case here. We also concede that something bad did in fact happen at 69 Wells Lane in New Canaan that morning. It's clear, and we will also concede, that Fotis Doulos is ultimately responsible for what happened to Jennifer Doulos, whether he did it himself or he had a compatriot who was involved in it down there. Because 
We know someone else was down at 16, or at least down in New Canaan that day, and we know that wasn't Michelle Traconis. The state has not proven where Fotis Doulos was that morning. There's some suggestions. We see the vehicles driving. There is a tiny amount, I emphasize a tiny amount of DNA found on a faucet inside the home, which I'll talk about in a minute. But whether or not Fotis was in Farmington, whether it's in New Canaan or somewhere in between, it is conjecture as to where he actually was and what he personally did with his own hands. Now, we're looking at evidence that's been going on for five years, collection of evidence, and taking statements as recently as last month from Mr. Gumieni, new statements from Mr. Gumieni. But there's been forensics, there was surveillance cameras, there were multiple interviews, there were family court uh, pleadings, there were the interrogations, you heard eight, nine hours of interrogations of Michelle Traconis. Even in hindsight, even now, major questions remain about what happened. And it's still unclear. It's still unclear what happened. And unfortunately, this trial will not solve that puzzle. It will remain a mystery, an unfinished puzzle. But again, this is not Fotis Goulos' trial. This is Michelle Traconis' trial. And because it's Michelle Traconis' trial, you must find beyond a reasonable doubt that Michelle conspired with Fotis Doulos, not just to cause harm to, to Jennifer Doulos, but to murder her. That that was the plot, that was the intent of Michelle Traconis on or before May 24th, 2019. Then you have to find beyond a reasonable doubt various elements that Michelle was part of a plot to get rid of evidence, some microscopic, some in opaque garbage uh, bags, but that she knew what was in it, knew its purpose, and what she did was, in, was the same exact intent as whatever Fotis Doulos had planned. But again, Part of what you have to prove here, and what the state has to prove, what you have to find, is that Fotis Doulos murdered his wife. The criminal information, which you will have, states specifically that Fotis Doulos assaulted his wife and restrained her and intended to kill her. Again, there's no evidence of that. It's speculation as to who actually did that, as to any of that, to be for that matter. No matter how you view this evidence, even in hindsight, five years later, there is nothing to suggest that Michelle had any clue about what was going to happen in New Canaan on May 24th, 2019. More importantly, there is nothing to suggest that Michelle would even think that Fotis was capable of doing anything like that. Again, Michelle simply did not know. Now, we can talk about what, family, what Michelle did know about Fotis Doulos. We can talk about his life before June 2nd, 2019, when Michelle was uh, after her arrest and being brought before the uh, police and being interrogated for that first time. This is the Fotis Doulos that Michelle had met down in Miami. It was very different than the one that the police were describing to him and what the police had learned from Jennifer's family and what they knew about Fotis Doulos. Michelle met Fotis in 2016 at the Miami Water Skiing Club. Both were members, both were competitive water skiers. They both had children about the same age and the children became friends. You heard from Warren Almeida about that. He introduced, Fotis introduced the babysitter he introduced his children. And at some point, Michelle fell in love with that man. He was an outgoing, fun-loving father, successful businessman with a high-end construction of homes business, a competitive athlete with similar interests to her. Obviously more similar interests than has been testified to that um, Jennifer Dulos had with Fotis. 
But she was also told, and you heard this from many people, that they were working towards an amicable, friendly divorce, that everything was going to be fine, there was going to be legal separation and an amicable divorce and custody. In September of 2017, Michelle did move to Connecticut with her young daughter. She enrolled her daughter in local schools, made her own friends, engaged in her, in her passion for water skiing. She traveled. She helped work on her daughter's athletic interests and her sports training. But more importantly, she also had her own business. You heard from several people she had an import rug business that she was selling in, in local um, Farmington Valley stores and to individuals. But Fotis always showed the side of him that he wanted her and others to see. He hid things from Michelle, just like he did from his friends and from his employees, including Pavel Gumieni. He did that for years. Even Lauren Almeida, who used to work for him, who considered him a mentor, didn't believe it when Jennifer suggested her that Fotis was having an affair. He was good at hiding what he was really up to. Now, in 2019, and we just heard that from the prosecution, there were some strains in the relationship between Fotis and Michelle. Just like Fotis, you heard, was lying to her, he was storing other women's phone numbers in his phone. He put some of those names in, in the Greek language, which she didn't understand. And she was upset, thinking that he was communicating with other women, but using men's names to, to hide that fact. They were written in Greek, and, there's, and Michelle didn't know any Greek. She had already talked about moving to Colorado with her daughter after the end of the school year. And it also looked like at the end of April, the custody fight was about to end. It was a favorable report. Everyone said that report was favorable to Fotis Doulos, and that he was going to look forward to spending the whole summer with his children. That was discussed not just uh, with the lawyers who talked to Michelle, but it was also discussed with his friends and those that knew him well. They were, quote, moving in a positive direction, unquote, at starting at the end of April. And according to Michelle's interviews with the police, she also thought everything seemed good by May. Everything was consistent with the testimony by friends, his co-workers, his employees and former employees, and especially the lawyers that you heard from, Mr. Meehan and Mr. Rose. This nefarious plot under those circumstances makes no sense. Why then? Why at that moment is he going to then plot with his girlfriend to, to kill Jennifer? Even in hindsight, that doesn't make sense to any of the people that you heard from. None of them. Let's talk a little bit about um, Pavel Gumieni. His name came up very briefly in the state's argument. Mr. Gumieni saw photos every day, practically, during the week for years, for many, for a decade, even before he worked for him. He came into that business, worked with him, talked to him, knew and liked Jennifer Dulos, helped her move down to Fairfield County without Fotis knowing it. He didn't want to upset Fotis, so he was actually helping Jennifer move her belongings out of the house without uh, tipping off Fotis that she was doing that. But what else about, what else do we know about Pavel? Even after Fotis Doulos was seen or believed to be cleaning his Tacoma, he had told Michelle that Pavel intended to sell it, and he told Pavel to find a replacement for it. He also told him to replace the car seats in that Tacoma. Remember, Pavel Gumieni was combing junkyards up in the uh, between Waterbury and, and Hartford looking for new seats. Fotis told him to call seats, if he called him on the phone, hardware. What is this, some kind of spy code? Why would Fotis tell Mr. Gumieni to not refer to it as seats, but hardware? 
who would be present at that point? Michelle or perhaps other employees? He didn't want them to know. Then you saw the picture. He took the Porsche seats, took them out of the uh, Porsche, put them in his vehicle, but in such a haphazard way. You saw that picture. They're, they're being propped up with a bucket. He's driving now his Tacoma with a bucket holding a sports car seat in his pickup truck. Despite all these red flags, doing all these things, after Fotis told him he wants them to do this because there may be some of DNA of, Mich of Jennifer in his vehicle, he does it anyway. Even with full immunity from prosecution, which the judge will talk to you about, he still insisted to you in questioning that he did not believe that Fotis would harm Jennifer. Even after, as long as a reasonable explanation was given to him as to why he should do these things, he believed that. And he went along with it. He knew more than Michelle did, and he still did his bidding. There are those people that came to the house the night before, May 23rd, 2019. You have Stephan and Beth Wright. You have Hutch Haynes. All of them talked about what a wonderful evening, happy evening it was. They talked about there was no bad mouthing of Jennifer at all. If you remember, Beth Wright, who is a domestic violence counselor, that's part of her job, it's one of her jobs, went so far as to say that they that everything seemed to make sense, everything was working out. They basically toasted the happy outcome that it was going to end very soon in a happy way. Hutch Haynes, who had known Fotis for years, for years, didn't think he could do anything like this. You heard that from him. That was even during the investigation, even after the police came and they had divers going through his water skiing time. I already talked about what the babysitter, Ms. Almeida, said. They thought Michelle, she thought Michelle was nice. And there are also, even through her, no prior, no prior examples or incidents of violence. There was a discussion about him wanting her to sign a piece of paper, yelling at her, but there was never any violence in that relationship. The professionals, attorney me and the guardian ad litem, the social worker, Sidney Streeter, they both were involved, me and was involved for years. He also said everything seemed to be working out. It was a favorable report. And Ms. Streeter, a professional whose job it was to keep an eye on photos to us, described how amicable and friendly that was on the Wednesday, I guess naming day for the one of the one of the daughters, where they were talking together, they were being civil. He gave her a chocolate bunny, and she took it from him and ate it. He handed her a cake. She took that and brought it into the house. She invited him to come out and sit out on the picnic table and have dinner with the children since the park closed early. You heard attorney Mike Rose, the divorce lawyer for Fotis Dulos, say that Fotis was keeping, didn't want to talk about the divorce case in front of Michelle. Said, please call me later. I'm sorry I can't talk while Michelle is around. But he also, he's the one who said, there was now light at the end of the tunnel. Everything was going to be fine. Things were looking good. Why at that moment would Michelle agree to risk her life, risk her daughter's entire family life to at that point say, I think we now want to get rid of Jennifer Dulos. It doesn't make sense. It's pure speculation. You heard a little bit about Anna Curry during the questioning of Mr. Kimball. You remember Anna Curry, which was uh, the woman who moved in with Fotis Dulos right after she had moved out and had been arrested. Her picture was shown to Michelle. And you remember, I can't remember if it was Clabby or Kimball referred to her as Michelle 2.0, remember that? That was a woman who had moved in, moved in with this man within a month or so of him being accused of destroying evidence on Albany Avenue with bloody shirt and a bloody bra 
connected to uh, Jennifer Dulos at that point. Then you heard, remember, from Petu Dupera, Clara. She was a friend of both Michelle and Fotis, had been to the house many, many times. She never suspected that Fotis would harm, his, harm Jennifer, not even after June 1st, 2019, when she never spoke to him again. She did speak to Michelle. She continues to speak to Michelle. She's here in the courtroom even today. Let me just talk in general about something that I think that maybe we can all agree on. The people that we trust and believe in are our friends and loved ones. And people usually are who they say they are. We don't immediately go and distrust them, even when certain red flags arise. Even if you think they're doing something, I wonder why he's doing that. You don't suddenly think this is a bad person. Our default in our, in our human interrelations is to believe people. We all do that. We also never think that we're going to be manipulated by someone we care about. This could never happen to us. But with the benefit of hindsight, we can't even believe that we were fooled and tricked in that way. I believe I asked most of you during voir dire if you think that you need to share everything that you're thinking and doing with your significant other or spouse. All of you at least acknowledge that, that they should do that, but I also recall saying that you don't believe that they always do. But that doesn't mean we stop caring about that person. It doesn't mean we immediately decide they're what? About to murder somebody? That's not how we think. We also know that Fotis Dulos committed suicide in early in 2020. You have that death certificate in evidence. You can see he died from the complications of acute carbon monoxide intoxication. It specifically says intentional inhalation of motor vehicle exhaust inside a garage, and you'll see the yellow box suicide is checked. Whatever Fotis Dulos did, it was not for or because of Michelle, and it was not with her. Fotis put up a facade until his last poisoned breath, and he died without ever acknowledging his actions or admitting his role even to his own children. He never gave answers, and he can't be held to answer. Everyone wants closure. Michelle is not the remaining half of a scheming plot. She was never part of the equation. That is pure speculation. She didn't know. Most of this trial has been about Fotis Dulos and absentia. You heard about the, the, the fingerprints. You heard about the uh, blood. You heard about the DNA. You also remember that the biologist Anna Valonis said that these KM tests, these so-called screening tests, they only suggest the possibility of human blood. It's a place for them to swap. And the suggestion by the prosecutor that, well, there's some DNA on the faucet, and we should assume that means that Fotis Dulos was in the house. It was, remember, it was a mixture between Jennifer Dulos's DNA and Fotis Dulos's DNA. It's, it's the only place in the house. Why would his DNA be there other than she took chocolate from him, she took a cake from him, the children all had touched his hair. They were playing basketball with him. And where else would they wash their hands before dinner but on the faucet in the kitchen? So a small amount of DNA appeared there, and it just stays there. It doesn't go away. In the same way, you heard Mr. Gumieni admit that Jennifer Dulles had been in his truck before. You want to know how a tiny bit of DNA gets? Remember, on the underside, not on the seat, but on the underside? It's because... Someone had sat in that seat. It was not blood. Those were sponge rubber seats. The state is asking you to speculate that there is evidence where there is none. But the absence of evidence, the absence of evidence is not evidence. You can't infer facts in a vacuum. Zero times zero equals zero, basically. You wonder how much blood would have been there 
If only uh, Fotis had not taken out a car mat that was never found in the suburban, how much blood would have been in the Tacoma if it hadn't been brought to the car wash? How come there was nothing in the Cherokee that maybe Michelle was driving and not uh, Mr. Goumier? There was nothing in the Cherokee because there was nothing to find in the Cherokee. What might have been discovered at 80 Mountain Spring Road if Michelle and Fotis hadn't done a little cleanup for a showing that we have proven happened the next day of that house? Let's speculate. The state would have you speculate about a smoke coming out of a chimney in the fireplace in the house. Unfortunately, it's in black and white. The original is in color, but that's the best we could do for today. You were shown a couple of videos. Two of them are within minutes of each other. Remember, that is a, that's a motion-activated camera. So, so to suggest there were just two times when there's smoke coming out of that chimney is unreasonable. It's unfair, and it's misleading in many ways. Police continue to investigate. They continue to assemble evidence. We, we, they went to Albany Avenue after learning that Mr. Dulos's phone had pinged on a cell tower on Albany Avenue, and they got the C4 cameras that showed him, not Michelle, putting garbage in black, opaque bags in various receptacles. Three receptacles, not six, not 30. Now, the state is asking you to evaluate in hindsight that she must have known what was in those bags. They were on Albany Avenue. They, she had told her they were going to Starbucks, but they went past Starbucks. Now, I believe the map show it's about one and a half miles past where the Starbucks is. But he told her, well, I just have to get rid of a few bags here. She told the police that he had done that before. Contractors, think about it. When you build a spec house. You heard that from Mr. Wright. You build this house, you hope, hope to sell it. It's not for a particular customer. But if you have to buy another dumpster, if you have to rent another dumpster, that comes right off the profit, comes right off the bottom line. So how many builders drive around and go to public locations and dump trash in, in receptacles that aren't their own? Especially since Friday morning, you already now know, was garbage pickup in that part of Farmington. But what do we, knew, what do we know today that we didn't know then? We know that Jennifer Dulos missed her appointment with a Dr. Geronimus that morning. We know that she was supposed to be in New York, that her children and the babysitter had already gone to New York. The call came in at 7 p.m. to the Nocanian Police Department that Jennifer was missing. They went to the house, they noticed something that looked like blood, and that's when the investigation began. Teams of investigators from multiple agencies took part in this investigation. They went through every point and every part of the garage at, at 69 Wells Lane. They found obvious signs of, of violence, and they're working against the clock. Now at 8 p.m. approximately, they found the Suburban parked on the side of Waveney Park. It had not been seen since 10.30 in the morning. Where was it? You saw school bus videos from Lapham Road. You don't see any time when that suburban is sitting there or parked there. Now, law enforcement learned, from, learned about Fotis from Jennifer's friends, that he was manipulative, that he was volatile. He had a years-long custody battle going on. Michelle, yes, was in the Raptor when he dumped those garbage bags on Albany Avenue. And the police thought Michelle knew what was in them, but she didn't know. And there's no way you could see without x-ray vision what was in those bags. Incidentally, they found nothing at 80 Mountain Spring Road. There was a coffee cup that was noted in the, in the recycling bin in the garage. The one thing that might have had evidentiary value, remember what uh, Detective Pierce, Detective Sergeant Pearson said, they found nothing of evidentiary value. She noted the coffee cup, but she didn't take it. Would that not at least be consistent with what Michelle said? Fogus told her he dropped coffee, spilled coffee, and that's why he was cleaning up and he needed some paper towels. But see, that doesn't fit the, the prosecution's narrative, so they didn't even collect that 
as evidence. So Michelle was handcuffed. She was taken down to New Canaan, 80 miles away from where she was after she gets kicked out of her house. The police accused Fotis at that time of doing something that she thought was impossible. And they accused her of helping him without proof. They repeatedly said that to her. You saw she was tired. She'd been arrested in the middle of the night. She was cold. They, she had a blanket wrapped around her during the questioning. But Michelle, they told her that Michelle didn't know the real photos. They knew things about him that she did not and that he used her. They told her she needed to tell them multiple times where photos, where, where Jennifer was. They threatened her. They scared her. They lied to her. All permitted under Connecticut law. They told her she was going to lose her daughter, her family, that if they found the body, she was going to get charged with accessory to murder. She kept saying she didn't know a dozen times, maybe more, but they didn't let up. There's no evidence to suggest that Michelle would travel the world, had competed nationally and internationally in sports, and wanted ever suddenly wanted to be a full-time mom to an additional five children who had just lost their mom. She had her own family. She explained that to them. She had a large and loving family. She had her good relationship with her daughter. Even the police admit in those interrogations that she was on the phone and listening to his family discussions going on with her mom, with her sisters, all while supposedly helping dispose of evidence of a murder. Michelle wasn't trying to replace anybody. She didn't want to be these children's mother. She loved these children. She liked these children. But that's a far cry from wanting to replace their mother. Yes, there was a toxic custody battle, but she thought things were working out in her favor. I'm going to talk about the timeline very briefly. You remember that Jacob Pytranker is the one who suggested to Fotis in Michelle's presence that he write a timeline. That's when she found out that he'd even been at Jennifer's house that previous Wednesday, a couple of days earlier. He, she was mad that he had lied to her about that. She was mad that, he, that she, he didn't tell her that he had been to that house. And she was angry because she thought everything was working out through the, the court process. But he was lying to her even about that. If you give any credit at all to Mr. Gumieni's revelation that Michelle made a disparaging comment about Jennifer about a month earlier, I remind you that this is a man who was given written immunity and he was given verbal immunity before that. He was a non-citizen told, told that he could be deported. There is one takeaway, however, from what he said. If you'll recall, what he said was that when they were bringing Wood up to the house, she was upset that her 12-year-old daughter's picture was being plastered all over the internet in connection with the disappearance of Jennifer Dulos. And what did she say, according to Mr. Gumieni? That when she shows up, I'm going to kill her. And you remember, Gumieni himself said that's what he thought, too, that she was going to show up. So... If she's already deceased, why would anybody say that? Why would Gumieni make that his response? Listen to the judge when he talks about Gumieni. There's a special instruction to be very careful before you consider the credibility of someone in his position. Both his timing and the circumstances of that statement five years later that it suddenly became a revelation should give you some hesitation. Why? We put on Detective Allegro last week. You remember what he said, that he's the one who suggested, is it possible to, to Pavel? He said, is it possible that Fotis used that kind of language in describing his wife? This is in the July eight-hour interview, if you recall. He used those exact words, effing bitch, okay? Pavel said, nope, never heard that. But that would have been the time, ah, but I remember Michelle Tricona saying something like that. He didn't, that didn't even jog his memory about that. So I suggest to you that that part, the part about that he referred to her in derogatory terms, was made up after he got a signed immunity agreement. 
to sort of ingratiate himself. Remember, it's not just that he's been given immunity for his testimony. He's been given a get-out-of-jail pass for anything that he may have done in connection with hiding evidence. And he knew why he was taking the seats out of his car <clears throat> at Dulos' request. Now, Michelle was overwhelmed. She was exhausted. She was in shock. She still talked to the police multiple times on June 2nd with her lawyer, on June 6th with her lawyer, and again on August 13th. She answered every one of their questions. Even when they accused her of lying, did she ever say, I'm out of here, I'm not answering any of her questions? No. She kept answering their questions. It got to the point, it got to the point where whatever they said, she started agreeing with them, whether it was true or not. I put one of the interview points up on the, uh, on the wall there so you can see the way it uh, played out, right? This is not just that they want her to be honest with her, they're saying there's no way he could have been home because of, through science. But we've already explained how that works with transfer of DNA, skin DNA, the, how much can easily be transferred from one person to another. And here is evidence of actual physical transfer of items barehanded between uh, Fotis, his wife, and all of his children. When she gave information, when Michelle gave information that was not within their narrative, that the puzzle pieces did not fit, they kept accusing her of lying. They told her she was wrong. They told her Fotis Doulas had to be at 69 Wells Lane. But the state hasn't been able to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was down there, even now. They suggest he's there. They've thrown out this, uh, this uh, darkened figure on a bicycle, uh, riding along in the area. There's no connection to any of that, to the disappearance or harm that likely occurred to Jennifer Doulis. And you remember, you also will have the, for the report by, um, by Ms. Streeter. And we put it in, I, this is the part I already mentioned. She specifically described some of the things. I mean, she's talking about detail. She put every detail that she observed, that's her job, but it was about as exact, uh, line by line, minute by minute of what happened in that house. And that easily explains why a small amount of DNA would be found nowhere other than on a faucet in the kitchen. You remember uh, Kristen Medell, the uh, DNA person, because she talked about how transfer DNA, they called it touch DNA, if you remember, occurs. And I submit that that's the reason, that's the more likely reason that that's the place where the uh, DNA was found. Otherwise, what, what are we supposing here that if it was photostos, he took off his gloves, touched the faucet, and then put his gloves back on, his now maybe bloody gloves back on, walked out the door so it wouldn't be anywhere else? That's what doesn't make sense. That's what's pure speculation on the part of the uh, state. And it's also clear that photos can't be in two places at once. There's also the fact, what's, what are we going to do about getting a body or an injured woman? What are they, so going to transport her on a bicycle? Remember, where they saw the red pickup truck was about 300 yards, if I recall the testimony. It's up to you, not my memory, from where they found the Suburban on a busy road, Lapham Road, in front of near the entrance to one of the biggest parks in this area, a public park on Memorial Day weekend on a nice day, that nobody would notice anything, that there are no other cameras from any school buses that use that route showing any transfer, or for that matter, showing that the suburban is even parking. That also doesn't make sense. Where do you get the cleaning up supplies? How do you carry all these things? How do you get them from one vehicle to another? outside that park on a busy, double yellow lane road. Now, there's no evidence as to when Jennifer's Suburban ended up on Lapham Road. What you do have, and I put these up, this is exhibit CC and triple C, and you'll have these documents in paper form. But there was a question raised about whether or not that Bluetooth connection of the phone belonged to Jennifer Dulos, or maybe it was the kids Maybe it was Lauren Almeida. But at this time, at 2.56 p.m. in the afternoon, when that Bluetooth connected to the, her Suburban, they were long in, away in New York City. So we know it's not them. 
But we have more than that. We have the Stratford police research that shows, if you look to the right there, that there were two numbers associated with Jennifer, one being uh, the, the 604 number and the other being the 499 number. And you will see that it's the, the, the number down at the bottom is that 5C number it connects to the 499 number. You see, it was a MAC, I think they called it the MAC number. If you look at number two on the right, the unique number is the same as the unique number on the left there at 2.56 p.m. There's also the report, remember, by um, Mr. Newth, the forensic guy from the, uh, from the lab who talked about this as well in a letter to Detective Kimball. So they knew this all along. They just didn't pursue that at all. Incidentally, in just response to something that the prosecution said, I'm not claiming that Jennifer went through the woods and got on a train. I'm suggesting that when they followed the scent, somebody followed the scent with a dog, and it ended at the train platform at Talmadge Hill Road, the Metro North. So they didn't follow up with that. Did you hear anything, anything at all about checking the train schedule or maybe looking at you know, cameras from the trains, whether somebody ran off that way after being in the presence of Jennifer? Now, Michelle did not push back when the police told her she was wrong. She asked them what they wanted her to say, and maybe she was wrong. Even when she wasn't, even when she was helping and trying to be truthful, they told her she was wrong if that didn't fit their narrative. And eventually, for example, the, the FedEx envelope, she told them she knew nothing about these license plates. They told her, that doesn't matter. They cut her off and said, we don't need to know. That's not important. Well, it wasn't important until, what, today, when you hear the state again talk about 2024, how important that was. They didn't even let her say what she wanted to say about that. Sometimes they were mistaken, sort of like the 30 stops when it was only three. You heard Kimball admit that was a mistake. He admitted a few times in answering questions, especially by Mr. McGinnis, those were mistakes. But the difference is those mistakes were under oath. He swore to some of these things. He couldn't remember who told him that. He didn't have any documentation. But when he swears to something under oath, if a private person does that, they'd probably get arrested and charged with perjury or false statement. For him, it's just a mistake. For Michelle, if she makes a mistake or misspeaks, it's a crime. That's the distinction that they're trying to make here. Deception, could I just have a time? Deception is an interrogation tactic in Connecticut. And you heard police are allowed to, to lie. They're allowed to deceive. But they're threatening when they're threatening a person to go to prison, maybe for many, many years, she's going to lose her family, she's going to lose her child. If she keeps telling them certain information, if she sticks to what she's telling them, those tactics can take a toll on memory and what you're going to remember or say, whether it's the pressure or you've been fed enough information so it changes your perception. And I'm not going to go into detail. You heard from my two experts, Professor Loftus and Professor Marion. One was an expert on memory and how people retrieve and repeat memory. Remember, this is nine days after May 24th. And for Michelle, it was just a mundane day. Just she did her routine. The only exception is she told them she picked up the phone. She told them that when it was in the office. She didn't have to tell them that. Why bring that up at all? Kent Mawinney was there. You saw the video of him driving in and him driving out later. Why would she admit she's the one who picked up the phone for 16 seconds, bad connection, and she hung up? You also, and, and I want to just say one thing about uh, Professor Loftus. The prosecution suggested by naming a bunch of other cases that she was involved in that somehow She's connected to the defendants on those cases that you should tar her with the, with the people those lawyers represent, rather than that it was about science and what people remember and don't remember. You know, that has nothing to do with how you should judge the facts in this case. Same thing with, um, I would say, about Professor Marion, the linguistics ex expert. She told you about things that maybe you don't know about if you're not bilingual or multilingual. One of those things is something called influency. And we talk about things like, will you listen to parts of those videos? Eh, eh, uh. 
Maybe the prosecution would have you think, well, you're stalling for time. But she said that's a typical response for somebody who only has mid-level proficiency. And when you're hammering at somebody, they're under stress. You, they confuse tenses. They speak in the present when they mean to speak in the past. Because in English, the present tense is the easy default. That and in the infinitive are the easiest way to speak if you're not fully 100% proficient in a second language. And things like stress and certain concepts, concepts, throwing in Spanish words in the middle of your sentence, that's all signs that you're just not proficient enough. You're just not proficient enough to handle these questions, especially when people are throwing them at you from different directions. And remember what uh, was said in a report, which you will have, authority figures, you believe, I think it was Professor Loftus that said that. If authority figure tells you something, you're more apt to believe it, that maybe you're just wrong. So maybe she was just wrong, but maybe Fotis Doulis was there. That was his phone, not her phone. And they would have to prove to you, beyond a reasonable doubt, they couldn't even be there, because that's how they've charged us. She told them about her weekend. She told them about everything she did that Friday that she could remember. And keep in mind, we'll put up the, um, we'll get to it in a minute, but she told them about the socializing the night before. She told them that uh, at, during that time, you'll remember, Fotis stepped out. He went and got steaks. And during that time he went out to get steaks, he had a conversation on the phone with Kent Mawinney. You haven't heard a lot about Kent Mawinney other than he's been charged with conspiracy to commit murder in this case. But he seems to be like an afterthought here. He may be the and others that you'll see are in the criminal information. He conspired with Fotis Doulos and others. But there's been no evidence about her involvement with, with uh, Kent Mawinney. So I suggest you can immediately discard that as something to uh, consider in this case. But, you know, we're talking about the fact that Fotis and, and um, Havel took the Tacoma down to 80 Mountain Spring Road the night before, right at the beginning of when Stefan Reich arrived with his wife to look at carpets and then to have dinner. But there's nothing that Michelle knew about that. She didn't know that Fotis had stopped at 80 Mountain Spring and or made a phone call to Kent Winnie when he stepped out to buy some more steaks. And she didn't know. There was nothing, in fact, to suggest that she knew that. On the early morning of May 24th, the thunderstorms, remember, Kimball said there were no thunderstorms we checked. He finally admitted that there were that night. And you have that map showing the red, where it's all coming right down towards their house in Farmington. And that's why when her daughter called her right, at, right before 1 a.m., she went to her room and slept in that room that night because the daughter asked her to. You have should seen also surveillance cameras from Eli Road, from Jefferson Crossing and Mountain Spring Road, that between the time that Michelle went upstairs to, to her daughter's room and you see the Tacoma leave 80 Mountain Spring at 5 3 in the morning. There's nobody traveling on those roads. There's no pedestrians. There's no bicyclists. There's no other car. Nobody, not a taxi. Nobody dropping uh, somebody off. The state would have you think he must have been sneaking through people's backyards in the middle of the night. But remember, we were on top of a mountain. That's why we put in that drone. Uh, video, you can see it's way, way up on the top of Avon Mountain, at the pinnacle of that mountain, with views, uh, at least from their house, facing towards Harvey, see 100 miles. The topography was why that video was shown to you. There's no evidence he was walking, running, riding a bike, or anything between the time of Thursday night and Friday morning. We do know somebody else was in the Canaan, and that was Pavel Gumien. And you'll have that Burla report, and you'll have the pictures that show that between 12.30 p.m. and 4.21 on the Plainville Farmington line, he's nowhere to be seen. He's disappeared. He claimed he was there all day. But first of all, you'll remember what um, Mr. Newt said. That dot on the lower left-hand side means that the, that the truck was parked behind the house. He had told you he always parks in the driveway, except that day. And I showed you the 
uh, video from across the street, you don't see any vehicle at all. But Newt testified that the truck started up at 12.30 and then is not seen again till 4.21. Coincidentally, that's exactly in the middle of the time when the Bluetooth shows up and attaches to Jennifer Dulos' Suburban at 2.56 in the afternoon. Just enough time to travel the 80 miles up from New Canaan back to the Plainville area, which is right next to Farmington. Then you see him at the gas station. They put in the receipt to show he's getting gas and how many gallons he got that day. Another point, why are we not seeing any pictures of a raptor? They spent hours, they claim, looking for Tacomas, red trucks, raptors. Is it, first of all, credible that there are no other red trucks that are seen on the Merritt Parkway in the entire hours that they're looking? Or did they just take a clip that said, this could be it, and we'll just put that into evidence to create a narrative that doesn't exist. No raptors, no black raptors at all. So how did Mr. Gumiani get, first of all, down to New Canaan or back? Where's the evidence that he didn't make a side trip? Talks about his Chinese restaurant that he went to, can't remember where it is, what he ate, or even if he was alone. We talked about the car seats. He said he replaced these car seats. There's nothing wrong with these seats. He ripped it apart, he said. And you'll notice, especially the one on the right, that's foam rubber. If there was blood, as the prosecution just suggested, wouldn't it stain foam rubber? How do you get that out? How do you get blood out of foam rubber? Remember, it was just a small amount of DNA that was found. DNA, it could have been touch DNA. And remember, she had been in that car. Jennifer had, been, had ridden in that truck before on those seats. You also have uh, we you also have the evidence of Pavel's um, phone. And you know that he searched during the month of May a whole bunch of other Toyota Tacomas. And he deleted all of his searches before the police got his phone. He deleted that he had been looking at uh, flights to Poland. He deleted that he was looking up about the disappearance of the uh, of Jennifer Dulos. And he deleted all of his search history and, mess and messages from Memorial Day weekend. Michelle didn't do any of those things. Michelle told the police, even when they insisted, when they told her that science proved that Fotis couldn't be home, that she did think he was there. She knew he had an appointment with Kent Mawinney. And sure enough, Kent Mawinney was there that morning. She kept telling the police she thought he was there. And they told her they would walk out and charge her with accessory to murder. She continued to maintain that story. Fotis could have been there. Again, we don't represent Fotis. But he could have been there. The state must prove the contrary beyond the reasonable doubt. We do know from the time that Kent Winnie arrived just around 7.20 after Michelle left to bring her daughter to school, the timing is not a coincidence. Kent Winnie was there for a reason that morning, but it wasn't to practice law. He's charged with conspiracy too, but there's no evidence that he conspired with Michelle. Is he that other named co-conspirator with Fotis Dulos? There's no evidence. We don't know. And here's a different question for you to ponder. If Kent Mawinney was a co-conspirator and he was there, why not have him pick up the phone? Or better yet, if Michelle was the co-conspirator, why have Mawinney there in the first place? Why couldn't she be the one to pick up the phone? Why need Mawinney there? What was his purpose? To direct her to pick up the phone? Same thing with Andreas Tutsi Artis. Remember, you were just shown a translation created by the police and the prosecutors to show you about Andreas's um, messages. They were in Greek. They were not in Greek letters. They were not in English like we were just shown. Michelle doesn't speak Greek. And so then the question becomes, what person would then send two hours later a meme that you were shown again to remind you what it was, a jokey meme, if that person believed that this was all a setup so that 
Fotis could have an alibi while murdering his wife. And it wasn't just to him. It was to two other friends as well. Again, in Greek, Greek letters, not English. <clears throat> you also know what Michelle did that day. You heard from Hutch Haynes about, about his wife, Erin, forgetting her purse at the house. Was that part of a plan to forget her purse? You remember the state asked, well, is that when you were discussing the plan to murder Jennifer Dulos? Mr. Uh, Haynes shockingly, well, what? But that's the way the question was asked of him, as if maybe he's part of this too. I submit there is absolutely no basis for any of that. It's as pure speculative that he had anything to do with it. The idea that his wife would leave a purse there just to create a reason for Michelle to be walking over there or driving over there the next morning to return it is as speculative as everything else that the state has presented. She had lunch with Fotis. She then went over to 80 Mountain Spring. You also have the stop and shop and going to Petu shop and all that stuff. I put this up here because you can see there was a plan by Renia Menudis, the realist her. We wanted to show the house we want to see it on Saturday. Can we arrange it? And he goes, sure. Now, why would he agree to let a house be shown to strangers on Saturday morning early if he's using that house as a staging ground for destroying of evidence? I don't know, getting rid of clothing, getting rid of body, whatever the state is claiming is going on at 80 Mountain Spring Road. That makes no sense. It makes no sense at all. There are four trips that Michelle told the police she made going back and forth. The first time she brought the wrong kind of vacuum because it didn't have a, a central vacuuming system. So yeah, four or five minutes she goes back. She told them in, her, in, in the timeline she prepared for the lawyer, which you have, that she went back and forth. Why put that in if this is part of some nefarious scheme? Why, why list that? I realize I'm getting close to my time here, so I'm going to have to skip over some of this stuff. The police quizzed Michelle over and over again. These were things that it's a test she just couldn't pass. They insisted she lied. They had a big chart of what they said she had said on other occasions and then tried to trick her when, they, uh, when she said something that was different than what she had said months before. She told people that she had a fire in the fireplace and Petu, if you remember, said she did that all the time. These are little clips from, the, from a motion-activated camera, and that's what you see. What was she burning in that fireplace? Firewood. Just like Gumieni said when he helped her bring wood up to the house. You also, if you looked at those videos, see how windy it is. It was very, very windy. Those trees are blowing all over the place, and you're on top of the mountain. So it is not unreasonable even in May, to have a fire going in your fireplace. Now, if you go to the garbage bags on Albany Avenue, you look at those, you also can speculate. What, what could not have been burned? You could burn garbage bags. You can burn ponchos. You can burn cloth. You can even burn sponges. Why not do that? Those are the items that would be, quote, incriminating. Police had that house for Jefferson C's for over a week that the evidence shows, and they found nothing. They went in there with cadaver dogs, other canines. They found no trace of any evidence that connected that house to, to uh, the disappearance of, of, of um, Jennifer Dulles. Briefly, I'm just going to mention a few other items since I'm running out of time. There's the Tacoma Key issue that was brought up. The key was lit sticking out of the side of the truck when everyone was leaving. And as soon as Fotis called her to bring it back, she brought it back to suggest, as the police have, that there was something nefarious or evil about it. Why didn't she just say she didn't have the key? Why not uh, not come back in the seven minutes that she came back? When it comes to the issue of the gum, and I'm going to end with that and with one other thing. I'm going to end, actually, there's the gum you will see that she's wiping her hands. She's not picking something up. So when the police told that to Colangelo, they were giving him false information. 
And I just want to play, that's going to be the last thing. I'm going to play that clip from the, um, from Calandula. So we are, looks like we're at 220. I just don't mention, uh, I'll just throw it in the back. I'll mention it. I'll mention it. I'll she writes, she's very happy about Starbucks and what's hard for Why? If I was going to dump me, if I was going to go around the city of Richie Clay Jokes, one of them, I should have all of our trash over the city. I don't remember that once. It would have just slipped my mind. We didn't do it one day, too. We haven't. I'm not saying the trash over the city. Unless she's legitimately on the phone, talking to me, and that's it, she's not paying attention. Right. And then she went outside the car. Yeah, and then she told me, she knows she's, yeah. She was outside the house. She was opening her clothes open and she got outside and she had a problem. She swore it was. She dropped the gun and she realized it was safety. And she had a child for a week. She got up the gun and she dropped. She said, That was one person in the world that picks up One person in the world that picks up gum. One person in the world that picks up gum. She never said that she picked up gum. Here's the state's attorney, the chief law enforcement officer for this judicial district saying she doesn't know. Maybe she doesn't know, and you've got the three detectives telling him something that's false to get him to come off the notion that she doesn't go. And I submit to you, ladies and gentlemen, if he thought she didn't know, then that's reasonable doubt right there. This trial is a tragedy, no question about it. It is a tragedy for many people, including people that are sitting here in this uh, audience, in this courtroom right now. But this case here is not about sympathy, it's not about antipathy and revenge. There's only speculation and no facts. We are all sitting here in hindsight, deciding what happened after the fact, what one should have known versus did know. What we can do when Michelle, for example, Now you've got one minute. Thank you. When Michelle picked up Fotis from the car wash, she didn't go in there. She had nothing to do with what Fotis Doulis planned to do with that vehicle on that occasion. Now, I don't get another opportunity. You may to speak. You may think that the state has a second bite of the apple. That's not fair, but it's important for you to understand the reason for this is they have the burden of proof on everything. We don't. So they do get to speak last, but I want you just to remember that they have a burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt for each element of each of the crimes the judge is going to read to you. And I ask that you reach the correct verdict, which is not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. morning. Before you proceed, Attorney McGinnis, uh, the jury would like a brief break. Yes, sir. Uh, we will continue with the closing arguments at 12 noon. All right.
All rise. This honorable superior court is now open and back in session. Good morning, y'all. Please be seated. <clears throat> Bring the jury in, please. Council stipulate, please. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Attorney McGinnis. Uh, last night, when I was thinking about what I was going to say to you this morning, it occurred to me what this case is really about. It is about a mother's worst nightmare. It is about a mother being taken away from her children in life or in death. It is about Petros, Theodore, Christiane, Constantine, and Noel, who went to bed on May 24th not knowing where their mother was, and she has still not arrived. That's what this case is about. And so the question becomes, who is responsible for Jennifer Dulos's death? Now, the defense in their closing argument suggested a couple of different things to you. On the one hand, they said it's likely that she's dead, thus leaving the possibility open that she's still alive. Do any of you really believe that? The other possibility is that Fotis Dulos is this monstrous murderer. And still a third possibility that Fotis Dulos wasn't responsible, but Jennifer Dulos is dead nonetheless. But what you didn't hear a lot about in the closing argument from the defense was about Hartford Run and the dump of the evidence. You didn't hear much about that. Very tangentially, they addressed it. I pose this question to you. Do any of you doubt that Fotis Dulos is responsible for the death of his wife? Do any of you doubt that he was in New Canaan on May 24th, 2019, murdering his wife? How else would he have had her bloody bra, her bloody shirt, blood all over the bags, his DNA in a glove found inside the trash? How? And so when the defense suggests that to you, I suggest that's not reasonable. And so once you conclude that Mr. Dulos is responsible for the death of his wife, you then go to the next questions, which are, is this defendant legally responsible for her death? Is this defendant legally responsible for conspiring to tamper with evidence, for acting as an accessory to tamper with evidence? Was the defendant motivated to harm Jennifer Dulos? I want you to make no mistake about this. This defendant hated Jennifer Dulos. She referred to her as a bitch who should be buried next to the dog. Now, I'm just gonna say this because we're gonna talk about Mr. Humiani in a few moments. The defense is trying to have it both ways. Disbelieve Mr. Gumiani about that, but believe him about the remark the following week. We'll talk about that. She had animus towards Jennifer Dulos. Even in her interviews, you heard it, and by the way, you're gonna have the interviews, so you don't have to take my word for it. She referred to Jennifer Dulos as a manipulator. She said, you people are toxic, referring to Fotis Dulos and Jennifer Dulos. She said that since she moved to Connecticut, it had been two years of torture. She even admitted, if you caught it, 
that she demanded that Fotis Dulos go to therapy with her because of Jennifer Dulos. Everything was not okay. And when the defense gets up here and they say to you, well, the report, everything was going so well, there was no motive, Fotis didn't have a motive, Michelle didn't have a motive. Think about what she actually said about that report for a second. Jennifer is trying to manipulate you, Fotis. Stick with the courts. She has borderline personality disorder. So even after the report came out, this defendant didn't buy it. This defendant didn't think everything was going to be okay. This defendant needed to go to therapy to see how Jennifer Dulos being in her life was going to impact her future. And so when they say that there was no motive, when they say that there's no evidence that Michelle Jones was motivated to commit this crime, I submit to you that is completely contrary to the evidence. And I also just want to say this. And I don't quite know where this fits in. That's for you guys as the fact finders to decide. There's something unsettling about the defendant and Mr. Dulos fooling around on the passenger side of that Tacoma on May 24th, 2019. And you'll recall that from the third interview. And where that fits into all this, I'm going to leave it up to you to decide. The defendant in this case repeatedly lied to investigators. Repeatedly lied to investigators. What does that say about her culpability? What does that say about what she knew in advance? What does that say about what she knew was going to happen to Jennifer Dulos and what she knew they did after the fact? So let's run through some of the things the defendant said to investigators. I showered with Fotis Dulos on May 24, 2019. I, 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 now, here's what's interesting about that. She is giving the investigators an awful lot of detail, isn't she? I didn't wet my hair. Fotis jumped in the shower with me. And of course, we know where that came from. This is what she told investigators about where Fotis Duels was on the morning of May 24, 2019. I saw Fotis talking to Kent in the office. Um, I thought Kent and the lawyers there, they're talking in the further admin in the house, no? Just explain. Just explain. Um, they're in, in the table, not the office. You, they, Kent and who? And Fox is Kent and Fox. Um, I, I brought my computer. I, All these details. He's talking to Kent at the table in the office. I grab my computer. You know he's in New Canaan murdering his wife. You know that because of all the evidence, the DNA evidence, the trash in Hartford. So what is she talking about? I didn't see Fotis' phone in the morning on the 24th. told investigators she didn't see the phone. She told investigators she saw Fotis in the shower. She told investigators she saw Fotis talking to Kent Mawinney. Until she didn't. Wait, I actually didn't see him. Didn't see him. 
as the investigators get more evidence and she sits down for a third and final interview. Now all of a sudden she didn't see him. Wait, I actually did see his phone. And incidentally, I just happened to answer the one phone call that he had in his timeline, the phone call that he set up the night before. Now, I am just going to say this. Her lies were so profound that the defense brought in two experts to try to explain them away to you. So what I suggest to you about those experts is, number one, Dr. Loftus couldn't point to a single thing, not one thing, in this record that the police officers fed her. Not one. So when the defense attorney gets up and says, you'll see in the report authority figures, I asked her on cross-examination, did the officer suggest that? I don't recall. Did the officer suggest that? No. Not one thing. And it's interesting, too. We talk about language proficiency. We talk about why she may have said the things that she said. I'm going to tell you exactly why, members of the jury, you should reject that. If that's really the case, she has memory lapses. She has false implanted memories. She doesn't speak the language. If that's really what's going on, why is she so good on details that don't matter? and so bad on details that incriminate her. Why? How does she know she bought parsley at Stop and Shop? She even told the police, if you'll recall and you watched the interview, that when she went up to Starbucks, she tried to order a chocolate croissant and they were out. That's the kind of detail that she provided. And yet when it comes to things that incriminate her, language gap, memory gap, you exercise your common sense. You're smart people. You get it. This is not reasonable. Here's the thing about the lies also. She doubled down on it, didn't she? When Detective Clabby told her during that first interview that Fotis Doulos had murdered his wife, after that, she went back to, I saw him in the house. She doubled down on these lies. In her second interview, she said she never read Fotis Duos' timeline. That's interesting, isn't it? Because his timeline, you'll recall, notes the call from Greece, notes the call from Andreas. Because it was designed to be an alibi for him, just like she was. And as you know, that phone call was arranged the night before. This defendant was undoubtedly part of this plan to kill Jennifer Duos. There's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. The cops asked her, why wasn't Hartford in your timeline? Oh, I was going to write that, but I got interrupted. Isn't that a coincidence? Isn't that convenient? Speaking of that, you heard the defense talk about Kent Mawinney. The evidence is, is that when that phone call came in, what did Kent Mawinney say to the defendant in her own words? Does anyone remember? Is this the call? The call. Isn't that strange? Freudian slip. You only have to find that the defendant conspired with one other person to find him guilty of conspiracy to commit murder. And it's obvious here that she conspired with Mr. Julius. She was part of his alibi while he was in McCain and murdering his wife. In the second interview, she told investigators that Mr. Dulos hadn't told her what to write in her timeline, but by the time we get to the third interview, he told her. So you think about that. Why is someone who is innocent lying so much? That's a question for you to answer. Now, I want you to also think about 80 Mountain Spring Road and the timing of everything. Why would Mr. Dulos, and again, the evidence is overwhelming that he murdered his wife. So why would Mr. Dulos invite her to 80 Mountain Spring Road to clean the house while he's cleaning the Tacoma that you know was involved in this crime, unless she was involved? Why would she bring cleaning supplies? Think about it for one second. 
I want you to just think about that. Fotis steals his head. While I clean blood out of a Tacoma from my estranged wife's death, can you clean the house? Is that reasonable? To say nothing of the fact that she completely omitted the Tacoma from her first two interviews. Why was that? Why wasn't the Tacoma mentioned? Why wasn't that brown stained paper towel mentioned during the first two interviews? <clears throat> also, think about how the defendant described going to 80 Mountain Spring Road. She says that initially, Fotis Duos called her to bring cleaning supplies. She kind of is, is distancing herself from what was going on down there. But you know that they actually went together. And it's not until she's pressed that she admits that they went together. And it's corroborated by the surveillance footage. <clears throat> They bring the things with us. Mm -hmm. They go to the house. Okay. For money. Okay. That's more or less what I remember. And he called me like at 1.50 something. Mm -hmm. And he calls me like at 3. Eight. Well, let me just tell you that at 1.33, Fulvis is driving Jefferson, or uh, driving to Mount Spring. And by 136, you guys are both arriving at the Nostra. Okay, so I went with the cleaning stuff. Okay, but you went with him. You guys are both driving into the driveway together, together like literally right one right behind the other. went together. So you say, well, Attorney McGinnis, that was just an innocent memory lapse, no harm, no foul. Put a pin in that. We're going to come back to that. Why would the defendant go to 80 Mountain when you know that this cleanup is going on? Think about what the defendant brought to 80 Mountain and what was later found in the trash. Go. And you remember what the bag for? So it got cut off, but they were asking her what the color of the sponge was. And she said yellow and green. What color sponge was found in the trash in Hartford with Jennifer Dulos's blood and DNA on it? What type of bags were found in Hartford with Jennifer Dulos's blood and DNA in them? With Jennifer Dulos's bloody bra and shirt in them? Think about the fires. Three separate fires on the afternoon of May 24th, 2019. None of those made the timeline. Just like Hartford didn't make the timeline. Just like the Keys didn't make the timeline. Who's lighting a fire on Memorial Day weekend? Better question. Who's lighting three fires on the Friday before Memorial Day weekend on a day like that? The fact is, is that she lit three separate fires at a time, and you know with certainty that the cleanup of Jennifer Dulos's murder is going on. And the phone data shows that she was at the house by herself. Her admissions show that she was at the house by herself lighting those fires. The surveillance shows her going back and forth repeatedly. Five minutes at a time, nine minutes at a time, fire, fire. She's not involved. Pavel Lumiani, one person ran towards the Tacoma, embraced it, and another one avoided the Tacoma. You guys will recall that image that the defense admitted into evidence where Pavel Lumiani is at the police department with oil looking to get his vehicle back. Does that sound like somebody that was involved in this murder? Everything that Mr. Gumiani said to you was corroborated by video surveillance, the infotainment system, the gas receipt. There's even surveillance footage of him leaving with the dirt bike in the back of his vehicle. You guys will recall that. You'll remember that there was only one exhibit, I believe, during the trial that I actually physically handed you. It was the surveillance shot because it was difficult to see with the plank in the back. You guys will recall that. 
Everything he said was corroborated by the surveillance footage. Everything. And by the way, if you're going to have the temerity in closing argument to accuse someone of being involved in a murder, at least have the brass to ask them when they're here on cross-examination. Objection, Your Honor. Well, at this point, the court can appreciate Fellas' argument, but ad hominem attacks should not be considered by the jury, neither should they continue. Mr. Gumiani stood an entire day of cross-examination. An entire day of cross-examination. And he stood up to it. He even told you little details like he had sold his motorbike to the defendant. She lied about that too, didn't she? She lies about big details and small details. And of course, he told you how the defendant took his keys. Now, up until the third interview, she didn't even admit that, that vehicle was at the Mount Spring Road. And even she admitted that taking those keys looked bad, didn't she? So this is where the problem is. This is where it's problematic. This is where we come back to, to this. All the things that we talked about in here that were said by you, not once, sometimes twice, as we've met two times before, that all of them were less than truthful. Now all of a sudden, you're taking the keys. You have to understand how that looks. Okay? You do look very bad. Why did she avoid bringing up the Tacoma in her first two interviews? Why did she not tell investigators that Mr. Dulles was cleaning the Tacoma? And then, of course, there's the coffee-stained paper towel that she doesn't mention until the final and third interview that she threw out in the trash herself. Think about all those trips back and forth, all the calls back and forth. Not only is his vehicle there, his being Mr. Gumiani's, but the defendant admitted it looked bad that she took his keys. Why would she take his keys unless she's trying to keep that vehicle there? Russell Speeder's car wash. Remember I told you to put a pin in that lie earlier about going to 80 Mountain Spring Road? She tried to pull the same lie about Russell Speeder's car wash. She initially said that Mr. Dulos called her to pick him up and then later had to admit, actually, we went in tandem. And then, of course, they say, are you sure you didn't go at the same time? Oh, maybe we actually did go at the same time. Members of the jury, that truck was clean. 18-year-old work truck, no profiles on the door. They destroyed the evidence, and she helped him. She picked him up. Her phone number was used. That's hindering. That's accessory to tampering with evidence. I want to just talk to you now, because the evidence in this case has proven the defendant guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I want to just pose these questions to you as you head into your deliberations. Is it really just a bunch of coincidences? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant answered Dulos' phone at Four Jefferson Crossing when he was murdering his wife in New Canaan? Is it just a coincidence that Dulos' phone is being moved and manipulated when only the defendant is home? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought cleaning supplies to 80 Mountain Spring Road where you know the cleanup of this home was going on? Is it just a coincidence that the call from Greece is not in the defendant's timeline? Is it just a coincidence that during the cleanup, only hours after Jennifer is murdered, the defendant is shuttling back and forth between Fort Jefferson and Eden Mountain Spring Road? Is it just a coincidence during these trips back and forth, the defendant starts a fire at Fort Jefferson Crossing? Is it just a coincidence that during these trips back and forth, the defendant starts a second fire at Fort Jefferson Crossing? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant eventually lights a third fire at Fort Jefferson Crossing? 
Is it just a coincidence that while Duos is cleaning the Tacoma, she takes a brown stained paper towel from him and throws it in the trash? Is it just a coincidence that despite no one telling her to, she took the keys to the Tacoma? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant travels with Duos to Hartford as he disposes of the evidence on the same day? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought black garbage bags to 80 Mountain and Jennifer's shirt and bra were found inside black trash bags? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought a green and yellow sponge to 80 Mountain Spring Road and two of those were found in the trash in Hartford? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant brought a broom and the police found a mop or a broom handle in the trash at Albany Avenue in Hartford? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant opened the door to the Raptor at the exact moment that Duos exits the vehicle to dump those license plates in the sewer and block that other vehicle's view? Is it just a coincidence that despite her daughter not being home, the defendant panicked when the police came to the house, went to three separate rooms and said, I don't want to be here? By the way, if the police come to someone's door while their child is not home, would you expect a reasonable person to immediately go to the door to make sure the child is okay? Unless, of course, that person just knowingly committed a crime. Is it just a coincidence that the defendant followed photos to the car wash and then tried to lie about it? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant's phone number and not Dulos's number was used at the car wash? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant lied and said she showered with Dulos when he was actually en route to murder his wife? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant lied about seeing Dulos in the office again while he was in New Canaan murdering his wife? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant initially denied seeing Dulos' phone on the morning that Jennifer was murdered? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant said she saw Dulos meeting with Kent Winnie at Fort Jefferson Crossing around the time of Jennifer's murder, the same information that was in Dulos' timeline? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant never mentioned starting a fire to the police until they confronted her in the third and final interview? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant failed to mention that the Tacoma was at 80 Mountain Spring Road during her first two interviews? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant never mentioned that Dulos had washed the Tacoma during her first two interviews? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant answered the one call mentioned in Dulos' timeline on that morning? as having been answered by him on the morning of his wife's murder? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant failed to tell police that Fotis Dulles' bicycle was at 80 Mountain Spring Road until the third and final interview? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant lied about not going back to 80 Mountain Spring Road to return those keys? Is it just a coincidence that Dulos told the Bell Committee to keep the defendant, quote, out of this when the committee brought up the defendant taking his keys? Is it just a coincidence that the defendant's DNA was found on the opening of a garbage bag that also contained blood stains, tape, and Jennifer Dulos's DNA? Are all these things just coincidences? Or is the defendant guilty? Now, during voir dire, we asked each of you, if the state proved its case beyond a reasonable doubt, would you be able to come out here and find the defendant guilty in open court? And each of you promised us that you could. We've done that. We've met our burden of proof in this case. Now, I want to show you, I have two minutes left here, the timelines. One last time, we're going to talk about these timelines. Now, Fotis is to the left, and defendant's timelines are to the right. And they have been referred to as timelines, but they were really just a script, weren't they? And maybe some of you remember from English class in high school, every script has three acts, doesn't it? The first act was the premeditation and killing of Jennifer Dulos. The second act was the cover-up through the destruction of evidence and the defendant's lies. And now we've reached the third act, except she doesn't get to write it. You do. You write the third act of this script with your verdict. What's the ending going to be? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, you have heard the 
closing arguments in the matter of State of Connecticut versus Michelle Taconis. The court will instruct you on the law, but the court will do that after the lunch and recess. That instruction will take about 50 minutes. Because the instruction will take that much time, what the court has decided to do is give each one of you a complete copy of the instruction so that you can follow along. Otherwise, it would be difficult to digest those instructions as the court is reading it and you are trying to listen. We will stand in our lunch and recess. Please do not discuss the case. Please do not talk to anyone about the case. And we plan to see you at 2 o'clock. All right. This honorable school.
Good afternoon. Please be seated. The court has placed on council's tables the final instructions. The council have their copies. Yes, Judge. Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. We can bring the jury out, please. Um, my, my only question, Your Honor, and, I, and I'm, I'm looking well, at Well, let's not bring the jury out and oh. also have your question. Hold the jury. Tell them to hold the jury. Sorry, Your Honor. Um, I just wanted to be sure that, um, and I haven't had a chance to look at this version, but to make clear and just quickly looking at it, that, and maybe the court would either out of sentence or if it's, it may be in here in this version, that the intent to murder has to come before an agreement to commit, to, to enter into a conspiracy. And I think it's in here, but I just wanted to state that for the record. I, when the When I originally looked at it, I think the order of the elements I mean, they're all in there, but I think that should have been first. And I don't know if that's now clear. I'm just noting that for the record. We can bring the jury out, please. Would counsel stipulate, please? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Judge. So, ladies and gentlemen, at this time, what the court will do is advise you on the law of the case. Because this will take approximately 50 minutes, the court has asked the clerk's office to make a copy of the instructions for each one of you. And we will ask Madam Clerk to hand out those copies now. Uh, you may choose to listen some and read some. You may choose to just read along. That's up to you. You have heard the evidence presented in the case. It is now this court's duty to instruct you on the law which applies in this case. It is solely this court's function to explain the law that applies in this case and how you are to apply it. It is your obligation to accept the law as the court states it. You may not choose to follow some instructions and ignore other instructions, they are equally important. You are the sole judges of the facts 
it is your duty to find or determine the facts. You are to recollect and weigh the evidence and form your own conclusions concerning the facts. You may not go outside of the evidence presented in court to determine what the facts are. You may not resort to guesswork, conjecture, or suspicion. You may not be influenced by personal likes or dislikes, prejudices, or sympathy. You may not be influenced by this court's actions during the trial or the comments to counsel or objections by counsel. You may not be influenced by the court's questions to witnesses. You are not to consider this court's actions as an indication of its opinion as to how you should determine the facts. If during the instructions the court refers to any evidence, it is only for the purpose of clarifying a point of law or a point of illustration. The court does not intend to emphasize some evidence and downplay other evidence. If the court's recollection of the evidence does not match your recollection, your recollection controls. The defendant justly relies upon you to consider carefully her claims and to consider carefully all of the evidence. The defendant also relies upon you to find her not guilty if the facts and the law require such a verdict. At your hands, the defendant rightly expects fair and just treatment. At the same time, the state of Connecticut looks to you to render a verdict of guilty if the facts and the law require such a verdict. The law prohibits the state's attorneys or defense counsel from giving personal opinions about the defendant's guilt or non-guilt. It is not their assessment of the credibility of witnesses that matters, only yours matters. In this case, as in all criminal prosecutions, the defendant is presumed to be innocent unless and until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The presumption of innocence continues with this defendant unless you determine based on all of the evidence considered in light of these instructions after deliberations, that the defendant is guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. The presumption of innocence applies individually to the crimes charged. The presumption may be overcome only if you are satisfied after deliberations that the state has proven the defendant's guilt to the crimes charged beyond a reasonable doubt. If you conclude that the presumption of innocence has been overcome beyond a reasonable doubt, then it is your duty to render a verdict of guilty on that count. The state has the burden of proving that the defendant is guilty of the crimes with which she is charged. The defendant does not have to prove innocence. This means that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt each and every element necessary to constitute the crime charged. Whether the state carries its burden does not depend on the number of its witnesses or on the amount of the testimony, but on the nature and quality of the testimony. One witness's testimony may be sufficient to convict if it establishes all of the elements of the crimes charged beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, you have heard the term reasonable doubt. The court will instruct you now on its meaning. We will first explain what is not a reasonable doubt. It is not a surmise, a guess, or a mere conjecture. It is not a doubt raised simply for the sake of raising a doubt. It is not hesitation springing from any feelings of sympathy, for the defendant or for any other person affected by your decision. Reasonable doubt is a real doubt, an honest doubt, a doubt that has its foundation in the evidence or a lack of evidence. It is a doubt that is honestly entertained and is reasonable in light of the evidence after a fair comparison and careful examination of the entire evidence. When thinking about the term reasonable doubt, concentrate on the word reasonable. 
Proof beyond a reasonable doubt does not mean proof beyond all doubt. The law does not require absolute certainty on the part of the jury before it returns a verdict of guilty. The law requires that after hearing all of the evidence, if there is something in the evidence or lack of evidence that leaves in your minds a reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the accused, then the accused must be given the benefit of that doubt and be acquitted. Proof beyond a reasonable doubt is proof that rules out every reasonable hypothesis except guilt and is inconsistent with any other rational conclusion except guilt. The state has the burden of proving the defendant's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, and that burden of proof rests with the state. It means that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt every element of each crime charged. The court will now discuss intent. Intent relates to the condition of the mind of the person who commits the act. It is his or her purpose in doing it. Specific intent is the intent to achieve a specific result. A person acts intentionally with respect to a result when his conscious objective is to cause such result. What the defendant intended is a question of fact for you to determine. All of the crimes charged in this case are specific intent crimes. As with all of the other elements, intent must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. The court would indicate to the marshals that no one is to enter the courtroom when the court is giving instructions, no one's to leave. Yes, the court will next instruct you on proximate cause. The state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that Fotis Dulos proximately caused the death of Jennifer Dulos. Proximate cause does not necessarily mean the last act cause or the act in point of time nearest the death. The concept of proximate cause incorporates the principle that an accused may be charged with a criminal offense even though her acts were not the immediate cause of the death. An act or omission to act is a proximate cause of the decedent's death when it substantially and materially contributes in a natural and continuous sequence unbroken by an efficient intervening cause to the death. It is a cause without which the death would not have occurred. It is a predominating cause, a substantial factor from which the death follows as a natural, direct, and immediate consequence. What a person's intention was is usually a matter of inference. No person is able to testify that he looked into another person's mind and saw therein a certain knowledge or a certain purpose or an intention to harm someone else. Because it is very hard to have direct evidence of the defendant's state of mind, intent is generally proved by circumstantial evidence. The only way a jury can ordinarily determine what a person's intention was at any given time is by determining what the person's conduct was and what the circumstances were surrounding that conduct and from that infer the defendant's intention. As jurors, it is your function to draw those inferences as long as the inference you draw meets the standard it has to meet as explained in connection with the instruction on circumstantial evidence, you are not required to infer a particular intent from the defendant's conduct or statements, but you may draw an inference if it is reasonable and logical. The burden of proving intent beyond a reasonable doubt is on the state. Now, the law does not require that the state in a criminal case prove a motive because it is not a necessary element of the crimes charged. It is not necessary for the state to prove what reason the defendant may have had for committing the crimes charged. Because crimes are generally committed for some motive, evidence of a motive may tend to prove the guilt of the defendant. 
In the same manner, if there appears no adequate motive on the part of the defendant to commit the crime, that may tend to raise a reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the defendant. If the existence of a motive can be reasonably inferred, that may tend to prove the defendant's guilt. If no motive can be inferred, it may or may not raise a reasonable doubt as to the guilt of the defendant. If the absence of a motive does not raise a reasonable doubt that the defendant is guilty, then the fact that the state has not proved what the defendant's motive was does not prevent you from returning a verdict of guilty. We will now discuss direct and circumstantial evidence. The evidence from which you will decide what the facts are consists of one sworn testimony of witnesses both on direct and cross-examination, regardless of who called the witness. Two, the exhibits which have been admitted into evidence. Three, any facts which the court judicially noticed. And four, any stipulations of the parties. In reaching your verdict, you should consider all the testimony and exhibits admitted into evidence. Certain things are not evidence. And you may not consider them in deciding what the facts are. These include arguments and statements by lawyers. The lawyers are not witnesses. What they have said in their closing arguments is intended to help you interpret the evidence. But their remarks to you are not evidence. If the facts as you remember them differ from the way the lawyers have stated them, your recollection prevails. Now, testimony that has been excluded or stricken. Some testimony may have been stricken, which means you may not consider it. Please remember that a lawyer's question by itself is not evidence, and you may not consider it as such. Now, the document called the information. You will have this document with you at the time you deliberate. The information is the formal manner of accusing a person of a crime. You must not consider the information as any evidence of the guilt of the defendant or draw any inference of guilt because she has been charged with a crime. As you will see, each count in the information contains the date and location of each offense. The state does not have to prove the exact time, date, or location of the offense beyond a reasonable doubt. However, the state must prove each element of the offense, including the identity of the defendant, beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, there are two kinds of evidence, direct and circumstantial evidence. Direct evidence is testimony by a witness about what that witness personally saw or heard or did. Circumstantial evidence is indirect evidence. That is, evidence from which you could find another fact exists, even though that fact has not been proved directly. There is no legal distinction between direct and indirect evidence as far as the weight of each is concerned. The law permits you to give equal weight to both. It is up to you to decide how much weight to give any particular evidence. Circumstantial evidence of an event, for example, is the testimony of witnesses as to the existence of certain facts or the occurrence of other events from which you may logically conclude that the event in question did occur. For example, you look out of the window before you go to bed and you see that it is raining. If you testify that you saw the rain falling, that is direct evidence of the fact that it had rained. On another night, you go to bed and the sky is clear. If you wake up the next morning and the cars on the street and the trees are wet, there is direct evidence of water on the cars, on the street and on the trees, but there is circumstantial evidence that it had rained. There is no reason to be prejudiced against circumstantial evidence simply because it is circumstantial evidence. You may make many decisions based on circumstantial evidence, uh, evidence rather every day, 
Proof by circumstantial evidence may be as conclusive as would be the testimony of a witness speaking about her personal observation. Before you decide that a fact has been proved by circumstantial evidence, you must consider all of the evidence in light of reason, experience, and common sense. Now concerning credibility, in deciding what the facts are, you must consider all of the evidence. In doing this, you must assess the testimony and determine which testimony to believe and which testimony not to believe. You may believe all, a part, or none of a witness's testimony. In making that decision, you may take into account a number of factors, including one, was the witness able to see, hear, or personally know about those things about which the witness testified? Two, how well was the witness able to recall and describe those things? Three, did the witness have an interest in the outcome of the case or any bias or prejudice concerning any party or any matter involved in the case? Four, what was the witness's manner while testifying? Five, how reasonable was the witness's testimony in light of all of the evidence in the case? Six, was the witness's testimony contradicted by what that witness had said or done at another time, or by the testimony of other witnesses or by other evidence? In deciding whether or not to believe a witness concerning any matter about which that witness has testified, keep in mind that people sometimes forget things. You need to consider whether a contradiction or omission is an innocent lapse of memory or a deliberate falsehood. Your assessment of the contradiction or omission may depend on whether the contradiction or omission concerned a small detail or an important fact. The weight of the evidence does not depend on the number of witnesses. It is the quality of the evidence, not the quantity of the evidence, that you must consider. In this case, the defendant elected not to testify. As you recall, the defendant has a constitutional right not to testify. That is her decision. You shall draw no negative or adverse inference from the fact that the defendant chose not to testify. Now, you may find that one or more witnesses made statements outside of court which are inconsistent with their trial testimony. You should consider this evidence only as it relates to the credibility of the witness's testimony, not substantive evidence of a fact. In other words, consider evidence of inconsistency as you would any other evidence where there is inconsistent conduct, and then determine the weight to be given to the witness's in-court testimony. Police officers testified in this case, and you must determine the credibility of a police officer in the same way and by the same standards as you would evaluate the testimony of any other witness. The testimony of a police officer is entitled to no special or exclusive weight merely because it comes from a police officer. You should recall his or her demeanor on the stand and manner of testifying and should weigh his or her testimony as carefully as you would weigh the testimony of any other witness. You should weigh testimony of police officers against all other testimony you heard in the case. You should neither believe nor disbelieve a police officer's testimony merely because he or she is a police officer. In this case, certain witnesses have taken the stand, given their qualifications, and testified as expert witnesses. A person is qualified to testify as an expert if he or she has special knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education sufficient to qualify him or her as an expert on the subject to which the testimony relates. An expert is permitted not only to testify to the facts that he or she personally observed, but also state an opinion about certain circumstances. This is allowed because an expert from experience, research, and study 
generally has a particular knowledge of the subject of the inquiry and is more capable than a layperson of drawing conclusions from facts and basing an opinion upon them. An expert witness may state an opinion in response to a hypothetical question, and some experts have done so in this case. A hypothetical question is one in which the witness is asked to assume that certain facts are true and to give an opinion based on those assumptions. The value of the opinion given by the expert in response to a hypothetical question depends upon the relevance validity and completeness of the facts he or she was asked to assume. The weight that you give to the opinion of an expert will depend on whether you find that the facts assumed were proved and whether the facts relied on in reaching the opinion were complete or whether material facts were omitted or not considered. Like all other evidence, an expert's answer to a hypothetical question may be accepted or rejected in whole or in part according to your best judgment. Allowing someone to give expert testimony is in no way an endorsement by the court of the testimony or the credentials of the witness. Such testimony is presented to assist you in your deliberation. Mr. Marshall, if there's an emergency, you can let the individual out but she cannot come back in. No such testimony is binding upon you, and you may disregard the testimony either in whole or in part. It is for you to consider the testimony with the other circumstances in the case, and using your best judgment, determine whether you will give any weight to it and if so, what weight you will give to it. The testimony is entitled to such weight as you find the expert's qualifications in his or her field entitle it to receive. And it must be considered by you, but is not controlling upon your judgment. You are also to consider his or her general credibility in accordance with the instruction on credibility applicable to all witnesses. In this case, evidence in the form of stipulations between the parties was introduced to show certain facts. The stipulation is an agreement between the parties concerning some fact or facts which you as the jury are bound to accept as fact during your deliberation. This evidence included the designation and identification of physical evidence submitted to the state forensic laboratory. The stipulations are to be used only for the specific purposes for which they were entered into and not to be used for any other purpose. The stipulations do not include credibility or the weight you may give to the exhibits. You will have the stipulations with you during your deliberations. The state has the burden of proving beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant is the perpetrator of the alleged acts. In other words, the state has to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the identity of the defendant. Now concerning witnesses testifying under immunity, you have heard the testimony of Pavel Gumieni. He testified under a grant of immunity. Although the state is permitted to present the testimony of someone who has been granted immunity, you must examine the testimony of such a witness who provides evidence against the defendant with greater care and caution than the testimony of an ordinary witness. While examining the testimony of a witness who has been granted immunity, you should keep in mind that he may have been looking for some favorable treatment when he agreed to speak with police and subsequently testify in exchange for immunity. Therefore, he may have such an interest in the outcome of this case that he may have an incentive to testify favorably for the state. 
You may consider whether his testimony was colored by his immunity, his agreement. Look at it with particular care. Look at his testimony with care and scrutinize it very carefully before you accept it. In considering the testimony of such a witness, you may consider where, uh, whether there was any motive developed in the evidence for providing information inculpating the accused. The factors that you may consider, among others, when evaluating the credibility of such a witness uh, include the extent to which the witness's testimony is confirmed by other evidence, the specificity of the testimony, the extent to which the testimony contained details known only by the perpetrator of the alleged offense, the extent to which the details of the testimony could be obtained from other sources, the circumstances under which the witness initially provided information supporting such testimony to law enforcement, and whether the witness has received the benefit, including a immunity from prosecution, in exchange for testimony, and whether the witness has ever changed his testimony. Further, notwithstanding any language in the immunity agreement, it is your exclusive role to determine the credibility of that witness. In other words, you and you alone are to determine whether any evidence offered by Pavel Gumieni is to be believed wholly, partly, or not at all, irrespective of any language in the immunity agreement that may indicate otherwise. And after the name Pavel Gumieni in this draft, please just eliminate the word it. The determination as to whether the state has proven the elements of the crimes charged beyond a reasonable doubt rests solely with you after a careful examination of all of the evidence presented. However, you are not required to disbelieve a witness because he has been granted immunity. Some people in this position are entirely truthful when testifying. Again, it is your duty to decide whether Pavel Gumieni is to be believed wholly, partly, or not at all. The defendant is charged in count one with conspiracy to commit murder. Count one of the information reads at various times and in various locations, including but not limited to the town of New Canaan on or about the 24th day of May 2019 in the area of 69 Wells Lane, Michelle Traconis, with intent that conduct constituting the crime of murder be performed, did agree with Fotis Dulos and other persons to engage in and cause the performance of that conduct, and one of them did commit an overt act in pursuance of the conspiracy, to wit, Fotis Dulos did assault Jennifer Farber Dulos in her home on the 24th day of May 2019, with intent to restrain and kill her in violation of Section 53A-48A and 53A-54A, subsection A of the Connecticut General Statute. Here, the state alleges that the defendant committed the crime of conspiracy to commit murder and that a co-conspirator, Fotis Dulos, committed an overt act in furtherance of that conspiracy by murdering Jennifer Dulos. Before instructing you on the definition of conspiracy, the court will read to you the elements of the crime of murder. The statute defining murder reads in pertinent part as follows. A person is guilty of murder when, with intent to cause the death of another person, he causes the death of such person or of a third person. For you to find the defendant guilty of conspiracy to commit murder, the state must prove that Fotis Dulos committed murder by proving the following two elements beyond a reasonable doubt. The first element is that Fotis Dulos specifically intended to cause the death of Jennifer Dulos. There is no particular length of time for Fotis Dulos to have formed the specific intent to kill. A person acts intentionally with respect to a result when his conscious objective is to cause such result. 
the intent to cause death may be inferred from circumstantial evidence. The type and number of wounds inflicted, as well as the instrument used, may be considered as evidence of the perpetrator's intent. And from such evidence, an inference may be drawn that there was intent to cause a death. Any inference that may be drawn from the nature of the instrumentality used and the manner of its use is an inference of fact to be, uh, to be drawn by you upon consideration of these and other circumstances in the case in accordance with the previous instructions. Declarations and conduct of Fotis Dulos before or after the infliction of wounds may be considered if you find they tend to show his intent. The inference is not a necessary one. That is, you are not required to infer intent from Fotis Dulos's alleged conduct, but it is an inference you may draw if you find it is reasonable and logical and in accordance with the instructions on circumstantial evidence. The second element is that Fotis Dulos, acting with the intent to cause the death of Jennifer Dulos, caused the death of Jennifer Dulos. This means that Fotis Dulos' conduct was the proximate cause of the decedent's death. You must find it proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Jennifer Dulos died as a result of the actions of Fotis Dulos. The state does not have to produce evidence of Jennifer Dulos' body for you to find that she is deceased. The state is only required to prove that Jennifer Dulos is dead and her death was by criminal means. Proof of the exact cause of death is not required, nor does the state have to connect a weapon directly to Fotis Dulos and the crime. In determining whether or not the state has proven that Fotis Dulos caused the death of Jennifer Dulos beyond a reasonable doubt, you may consider both direct and circumstantial evidence. And please see the previous instructions on direct and circumstantial evidence. Again, the defendant is charged in count one with conspiracy to commit murder. The court has already defined the crime and all of the elements of murder. The statute defining conspiracy reads in pertinent part as follows. A person is guilty of conspiracy when, with the intent that conduct constituting a crime be performed, she agrees with one or more persons to engage in or cause the performance of such conduct, and any one of them commits an overt act in pursuance of such conspiracy. To constitute the crime of conspiracy, the state must prove the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. One, there was an agreement between the defendant and one or more persons to engage in conduct constituting the crime of murder, which conspiracy the defendant specifically intended to join. Two, there was an overt act in furtherance of the subject of the agreement by any one of those persons. Three, the defendant specifically intended that one of the co-conspirators, namely Fotis Dulos, intended to commit the crime of murder. The size of the defendant's role does not determine whether she may be convicted of conspiracy. Rather, what is important is whether the defendant willfully participated in the activities of the conspiracy with knowledge of its illegal ends. Participation in a single act in furtherance of the conspiracy is enough to sustain a finding of knowing participation. The first element is that there was an agreement between two or more persons. It was not necessary for the state to prove that there was a formal or express agreement between them. It is sufficient to show that the parties intentionally engaged in a mutual plan to do a criminal act. Circumstantial evidence is sufficient to prove that there was an agreement because conspiracies by their very nature are formed in secret and only rarely can be proven by other than circumstantial evidence. It is not necessary to establish that the defendant and the defendant's alleged co-conspirators signed papers, shook hands, or uttered the words, we have an agreement. 
but rather a conspiracy can be inferred from the conduct of the accused. The mere knowledge, acquiescence, or approval of the object of the agreement without cooperation or agreement to cooperate is not sufficient to make one a party to a conspiracy to commit the criminal act. <clears throat> mere presence at the scene of the crime, even when coupled with knowledge of the crime, is insufficient to establish guilt of the conspiracy to commit the crime. In order to convict a person of conspiracy, the state need not show that such person had direct communication with all other conspirators. It is not necessary that each conspirator be acquainted with all others or even know their names. It is sufficient if she has come to an understanding with at least one of the others and has come to such understanding with that person to further a criminal purpose. Additionally, it is not essential that she know the complete pan, uh, plan of the conspiracy in all of its details. It is enough if she knows that a conspiracy exists or that she is creating one, that she is joining with it at least one person in an agreement to commit a crime. Therefore, in order to convict the defendant on the charge contained in the information, the first element is that the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant specifically intended to enter into an agreement with at least one other person to engage in conduct constituting murder. The second element is that at least one of the alleged co-conspirators did an overt act to further the purpose of the conspiracy. It does not matter which one of the alleged co-conspirators did the overt act. It need not be the defendant, and it need not be a criminal act. An overt act is any step, action, or conduct that is taken to achieve or further the objective of the conspiracy. An overt act, therefore, is one that is committed or caused to be committed by any member of the conspiracy in an effort to accomplish some objective or purpose of the conspiracy. The overt act cannot, however, be held against the other alleged co-conspirators if it was not intended to further the general purposes of the conspiracy, but was secretly intended to further the actor's own personal purpose. The overt act must be a subsequent independent act that follows the formation of the conspiracy. The third element is that the defendant had the intent that a murder be committed. This means that the defendant must specifically intend that every element of the plan be accomplished. As to this count, the defendant may not be found guilty unless the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant specifically intended that the murder be accomplished when she entered into the agreement. In summary, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that one, the defendant had an agreement with one or more persons to commit murder. Two, at least one of the co-conspirators did an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. And three, the defendant specifically intended to enter into the agreement and intended the conduct constituting the crime of murder be performed. If you unanimously find that the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt each of the elements of the crime of conspiracy to commit murder, then you shall find the defendant guilty. On the other hand, if you unanimously find that the state has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt any one of the elements, you shall find the defendant not guilty. The court will now explain accessorial liability. A person is criminally liable for a crime if she directly commits it or if she is an accessory in the criminal act of another. The statute defining accessorial liability reads in pertinent part as follows. 
a person acting with the mental state required for the commission of an offense who solicits, requests, commands, importunes, or intentionally aids another person to engage in conduct which constitutes an offense shall be criminally liable for such conduct and may be prosecuted and punished as if she were the principal offender. This statute does not connect those five acts specified with the word and, but separates them by the word or. A person is an accessory if she solicits or requests or commands or importunes or intentionally aids another person to engage in conduct that constitutes an offense. Solicit means to attempt or to entice someone to do wrong. Importune means to demand or urge. Aid means to assist, help, or support. A person acts intentionally with respect to a result when her conscious objective is to cause such result. Intentionally aid, therefore, means to act in any manner, the conscious objective of which is to assist, help, or support. And for this, please see the instruction on specific intent. If the state proves beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant did any of these things specified in the statute, she is guilty of the substantive crime, in this case, tampering with physical evidence, as though she had directly committed it or participated in its commission. To establish the guilt of the defendant as an accessory for assisting in the criminal act of another, the state must prove criminality of intent and community of unlawful purpose. That is, for the defendant to be found guilty as an accessory, it must be established that she acted with the mental state necessary to commit the crime of tampering with physical evidence. And in furtherance of that crime, she solicited, requested, commanded, importuned, or intentionally aided the principal to commit tampering with physical evidence. Evidence of mere presence as an inactive companion or passive acquiescence for the doing of innocent acts which, in fact, aid in the commission of a crime is insufficient to find the defendant guilty as an accessory under the statute. Nevertheless, it is not necessary to prove that the defendant was actually present or actively participated in the actual commission of the crime, in this case, tampering with physical evidence. The rule is that a person who solicits, requests, commands, importunes, or intentionally aids in the commission of a crime is guilty of that very crime. Thus, for you to find the defendant guilty of this charge, you must unanimously find that the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant had the intent to commit the crime charged and did solicit, request, command, importune, or intentionally aid another in the commission of the crime of tampering with physical evidence. Court will now discuss the counts two and four, conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence. The defendant is charged in counts two and four with conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence. Now, please refer to this court's instructions on the inchoate offense of conspiracy. Count two of the information reads, and the aforesaid state's attorney further accuses the defendant, Michelle Traconis, of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence and charges that on or about the 24th day of May 2019 in the city of Hartford, Connecticut, in the area of Albany Avenue, the defendant, Michelle Traconis, with the intent that conduct constituting the crime of tampering with physical evidence be performed, did agree with Fotis Dulos to engage in and cause the performance of that conduct, and one of them did commit an overt act in pursuance of the conspiracy, to wit, the defendant traveled with Fotis Dulos to the Hartford area for the purpose of disposal of physical evidence 
relating to the murder of Jennifer Farber Dulos in the city of Hartford on the 24th day of May 2019 in violation of section 53A-48 and 53A-155 subsection A subsection one of the Connecticut General Statute. Count four of the information reads, and the aforesaid state's attorney further accuses the defendant, Michelle Traconis, of conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence and charges that on or about the 29th day of May 2019 in the town of Avon, Connecticut, in the area of 265 West Main Street, the defendant, Michelle Traconis, with the intent that conduct constituting the crime of tampering with physical evidence be performed, did agree with Fotis Dulos to engage in and cause the performance of that conduct, and one of them did commit an overt act in pursuance of the conspiracy to wit, Fotis Dulos did transport a 2001 Toyota Tacoma used in the commission of the murder of Jennifer Farber Dulos to Russell Speeder's car wash in Avon on the 29th day of May 2019 for the purpose of having evidence related to that murder concealed and destroyed in violation of sections 53A-48A and 53A-155A1 of the Connecticut General Statute. First, the court must define the offense of tampering with physical evidence. A person is guilty of tampering with or fabricating physical evidence if believing that a criminal investigation conducted by a law enforcement agency or an official proceeding is pending or about to be instituted, she alters, destroys, conceals, or removes any item or thing with the purpose to impair its availability in such criminal investigation or official proceeding. The first element is that the defendant believed that a criminal investigation conducted by a law enforcement agency or an official proceeding was pending or about to be instituted. It does not matter whether the investigation or proceeding was actually pending or not, as long as the defendant believed that it was. An official proceeding is any proceeding held or that may be held before any legislative, judicial, administrative, or other agency or official authorized to take evidence under oath, including any referee, hearing examiner, commissioner, or notary, or other person taking evidence in connection with any proceeding. The second element is that the defendant tampered with physical evidence. Physical evidence means any article, object, or other item of physical substance that is or about to be produced or used as evidence in an official proceeding. The third element is that the defendant concealed, that really should read concealed, an item with the purpose of impairing its availability in such proceeding. A person acts with intent when her conscious objective is to cause such result. In summary, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant, one, believed that a criminal investigation conducted by a law enforcement ag uh, agency, rather, or an official proceeding was pending or about to be instituted, two, tampered with physical evidence, and three, specifically intended to conceal an item with the purpose of impairing its verity or availability. A person acts with intent when their conscious objective is to cause such result. If you unanimously find that the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt each of the elements of the crime of tampering with physical evidence, you shall find the defendant guilty. On the other hand, if you unanimously find that the state has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt any one of the elements, you shall find the defendant not guilty. Now the court will discuss tampering with physical evidence as an accessory. The defendant is charged in counts three and five with tampering with physical evidence as an accessory. 
In considering the offense of tampering with physical evidence as an accessory, please refer to the court's instruction on accessorial liability. Count three of the information reads, and the aforesaid state's attorney further accuses the defendant, Michelle Taconis, of tampering with physical evidence and charges that on or about the 24th day of May 2019, within the city of Hartford, Connecticut, in the area of Albany Avenue, the defendant, Michelle Traconis, <coughs> believing that a criminal investigation conducted by a law enforcement agency was pending and about to be instituted, <coughs> did alter, destroy, conceal, or remove a thing with the purpose to impair its availability in that criminal investigation and official proceeding in violation of Section 53A-155A1 and 53A-8A of the Connecticut General Statutes. Count 5 of the information reads, and the aforesaid state's attorney further accuses the defendant, Michelle Traconis, of tampering with physical evidence on or about the 29th day of May 2019 within the town of Avon, Connecticut, in the area of 265 West Main Street. The defendant, Michelle Traconis, believing that a criminal investigation conducted by a law enforcement agency was pending and about to be instituted, did alter, destroy, conceal, and remove a thing with the purpose to impair its availability in that criminal investigation and official proceeding in violation of Section 53A-155A1 and 53A-8A of the Connecticut General Statute. That sentence, ladies and gentlemen, should read in the disjunctive to be instituted, it alter, destroy, conceal, or remove a thing rather than and. As previously stated, the elements of tampering with physical evidence are as follows. Such person, one, believed that a criminal investigation conducted by a law enforcement agency was pending or about to be instituted. Two, tampered with physical evidence. And three, specifically intended to impair the verity or availability of the evidence. Please refer back to the instructions on the elements of tampering with physical evidence. <coughs> The rule is that a person who solicits, requests, importunes, or intentionally aids in the commission of a crime is guilty of that very crime. Thus, for you to find the defendant guilty of these counts as an accessory, you must unanimously find that the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt that the defendant had the intent to commit the crime charged and did solicit, request, command, importune, or intentionally aid another in the commission of the crime of tampering with physical evidence. If you unanimously find that the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt each of the elements of the crime of tampering with physical evidence, then you shall find the defendant guilty. On the other hand, if you unanimously find that the state has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt any one of the elements, then you shall find the defendant not guilty. The defendant is charged in count six with hindering prosecution in the second degree. The statute defining this offense reads in pertinent part as follows. A person is guilty of hindering prosecution in the second degree when such person renders criminal assistance to another person who has committed a class A felony. Murder is a class A felony. For you to find the defendant guilty of this charge, the state must prove the following elements beyond a reasonable doubt. The first element is that the defendant rendered criminal assistance. A person renders criminal assistance when, with intent to prevent, hinder, or delay the discovery or apprehension of, or the lodging of a criminal charge against, a person whom she knows or believes has committed a felony or is being sought by law enforcement officials for the commission of a felony or with intent to assist the person in profiting or benefiting from the commission of a felony 
provide such person with transportation or other means of avoiding discovery or apprehension, suppresses by an act of concealment, alteration, or destruction any physical evidence that might aid in the discovery or apprehension of such person or in the lodging of a criminal charge against such person. The second element is that she rendered criminal assistance to a person who committed a Class A felony. According to the law in Connecticut, murder is a Class A felony. The defendant need not know the classification of the felony. Please bear in mind, however, that although the person to whom the defendant rendered assistance must have actually committed murder, he need not have been arrested, prosecuted, or convicted of the offense. In summary, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt that one, the defendant rendered criminal assistance to Fotis Dulos, and two, Fotis Dulos committed murder. If you unanimously find that the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt each of the elements of the crime of hindering prosecution in the second degree, then you shall find the defendant guilty. On the other hand, if you unanimously find that the state has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt any one of the elements, you shall find the defendant not guilty. Now, these are final instructions concerning note-taking and deliberations. If you took notes during the evidence, you may use them during your deliberations, and you may discuss your notes with your fellow jurors. Remember that notes are merely aids to your memory and should not be given precedence over your independent recollection of the evidence. If there is a conflict between your recollection and your notes or the notes of any other juror, it is your recollection of the evidence that must prevail. No juror's notes constitute evidence. Please recall the earlier instruction on what constitutes evidence. Your verdict must be based exclusively on evidence presented at trial and the principles of law given to you in these final instructions. A juror who has not taken notes should rely on his or her recollection and not be influenced by the fact that other jurors have taken notes. Notes are only a tool and are not always accurate. Do not assume that a voluminous note taker has taken notes that are more accurate than your memory. You, you may discuss your notes with your fellow jurors during deliberations. The decision to discuss your notes is yours alone. After the trial has concluded, the court staff will collect the notes and destroy them. You may have testimony played back or video played back if you deem it essential during your deliberations. You will have all exhibits with you during your deliberations. In deciding whether the defendant is guilty or not guilty, you should not consider the possible punishment or consequences in the event of a conviction. This is a matter exclusively within the court function under the limitations and restrictions imposed by statute. You are to find the defendant guilty or not guilty uninfluenced by the possible punishment or consequence that may follow. You should not be influenced by any sympathy for the defendant, the defendant's family, the complainant, the complainant's family, or for any other person who in any way may be affected by your decision. Now, in conclusion, this court impresses upon you that you are duty-bound as jurors to determine the facts and apply the law as this court has explained it and to render a verdict of not guilty or guilty as to each count. When you reach a verdict, it must be unanimous. It is the duty of each juror to discuss and consider the opinions of the other jurors. Despite that, it is your individual duty to make up your mind and to decide the case upon the basis of your own individual judgment and conscience. Soon you will retire to the jury room. Do not begin deliberations until you have selected one of your members as the foreperson of the jury. And you have received the information and the exhibits. 
You may only deliberate when all of you are present in the jury room. Please inform the marshal when you have reached the verdict, but do not tell the marshal your verdict. You will be asked to return to the courtroom where your foreperson will announce the verdict orally in response to questions from the courtroom clerk. The rest of the panel will be asked whether they concur with the verdict. If you have any questions, please send them out by way of a note signed by the four person and marked with the time of day and please be specific. We would ask all of the regular jurors at this time to retire to the deliberation room and ask the alternates to remain. Judge. Mayor, may we just approach it sidebar briefly? Yes. So the court believes that for this case, over, the court believes 200 jurors were voir dire. And the responses that you gave to the attorneys and considered by the attorneys and also heard by this court showed that it was clear that you would be excellent jurors for this case. This case is different from a lot of cases. This case is different in complexity. This case is different in length. This case is different in media attention. The court will have to release you today from the jury. However, if any one of the jurors is not able to continue, you will have to be pressed back into service to continue the deliberations, which will start anew if you are required to come back. So it is with the gratitude of the state of Connecticut and the parties that we have had you as jurors in this case. There will be no lack of interest by the media and what you think. And hopefully you'll be able to get out of the door today before someone approaches you. What the court would instruct you to do is please, because you will be asked to return if jurors are no longer able to continue. Avoid media coverage, avoid talking to the media, avoid talking to people about your service as a juror in this case. So um, we would thank you. And hopefully this experience has not been such that you cannot recover. So thank you and please follow the marshal. And you may leave your notebooks and those instructions.
and the court will hear counsel on exceptions to the charge. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, good afternoon, <clears throat> Judge. Just on the bottom of, uh, actually beginning the second half of page 52, uh, and this relates specifically to counts two and four, conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence. Um, you did earlier in the charge direct the jury back to the incohate or uh, the conspiracy instructions. Um, however, the summary simply includes the elements for tampering with evidence. And my concern is that obviously the allegation here is a conspiracy. So we would just simply need to show that there was an agreement to commit tampering with evidence and that there was an overt act in furtherance of the agreement, not that the defendant actually tampered with physical evidence for this particular count. And I would note also, Judge, that um, on page 56, with accessorial liability, you did bring the accessorial charge back uh, when finalizing the summary. So I would ask that the court consider um, instructing the jury on the elements of conspiracy to commit tampering with evidence, namely that there was an agreement to tamper with evidence and an overt act by a co-conspirator. So what the court will do, the court did have the opportunity um, it was a short opportunity to have counsel review the final charge. So what the court would ask counsel to do, specifically the state, indicate on the final draft the language you want included. The court may have to just re-instruct the jury on that count. Yes, sir. Um, I'll do that now. And Attorney Schoenhorn. Thank you. Um, I would first just incorporate all of the um, arguments that I made and, and uh, suggestions I made during our charging conference. Um, and I'd also just note for the record that to the extent the court did not include my proposals uh, that I asked, th that I would request that the court having done so just to preserve the record. Um, there are a few minor um, items that I only noted during the uh, during the discussion. Um, yesterday, I know that the court did add at the state's request a proximate cause instruction. In reviewing it, however, I realized that in this particular case, there is no, uh, th this is the kind of instruction that if a person, I don't know, is shot, they go to the hospital, then they get sick, and then they die, the issue is the proximate cause. I don't know if that in this case it was appropriate, so I would have just objected to that instruction being given. Um, I would note that on the bottom of page 12, when the court gave its motive instruction, which the state had proposed, uh, it's both in the negative in the sense that if there's a motive, it says that it may tend to prove the defendant's guilt, but the next sentence says if there's no motive, it can be referred, not that it may raise a reasonable doubt, but may or may not. So I just note that was unbalanced in the sense that a motive may or may not tend to prove a guilt, and no motive may or may not raise a reasonable doubt. But the way it's written, it's only slanted towards the state's version of events. So I object to that. Um, I did. I said yesterday about the issue about the type and number of wounds inflicted should not have been included. We talked about that, but I think we ended up concentrating on whether it was a weapon. But I believe that this language about the type and number of wounds, we don't have any evidence of that in this case. So I've just renew my objection to that. Um, I already said what I on page 35. There's the reference to a um, a weapon. And there I would uh, make, just raise what I said before. Um, on page 38, for the definition of conspiracy, it's not that just she activities that she have cons uh, knowledge of its illegal ends. She has to have the, the specific intent to cause death. In other words, not just to... Um, have knowledge of its ends, it would have to be specific knowledge uh, of the crime of murder itself. And finally, 
I believe on page 59, the court did leave in uh, one of the elements, alternative ways to commit the crime of hindering is uh, suppression by an act of concealment, alteration, or destruction. That's not in the criminal information. Only the issue, the first one, which is the allegation that she provided a person with transportation or other means of avoiding discovery, suppressing, concealing, altering, or destru destroying evidence is not in the information. That's certainly not a, um, it's not the same thing. It's different acts. So I would ask that the court remove that and, and instruct the jury to disregard that. Thank you. Very good. So the state wish to be heard on the uh, last objection uh, or exception by uh, Attorney Sean Orn concerning page 59. Yes, I can jump in, Your Honor, because Attorney McGinnis is writing um, with respect to the, the conspiracy count. Uh, with respect to what counsel is indicating about, I'm sorry, if you can just direct me to the page. Page 59, 59. the second bullet point. Oh, I think it's very clear in the state's charging, Your Honor. We charge transportation or other means of avoiding discovery or apprehension. Uh, Your Honor, so I think we did discuss this yesterday, and Your Honor drew attention to the fact that there's that or, or other means. Uh, that or other means may act, the jury can take into account all of, all or nothing that Your Honor cites in the, uh, in the jury instructions, so the state would ask that it remain as said. And just briefly, I believe the uh, charge has to do with avoiding discovery and apprehension of the person, not evidence. And that's why they're not the same. Thank you. Attorney McGinnis is writing a lot, so the court is not certain they can read it. <laughs> uh, we can take a, a recess at this point and I allow can, Attorney McGinnis to... I can type it at the recess. That, that would be better, and then the court will read... Or designate the page and ask the jury to Too many. consider this instruction rather than the one that was read. Too so many what we will, arrows. Too many arrows. <laughs> so what we will do is just take uh, a recess. How long do you think you will need it? Uh, Ten minutes. Well, let's come. Let's come back at uh, three fifty. Stand right. in recess. Thank you. All rise. This honorable superior.
Council stipulate, please. Yes, Judge. Yes. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, the court read to you uh, the instructions on the law. Now, you have a copy of it. Now, what the court would indicate is that if you see any um, sentence that doesn't make sense, you can just inquire of the court what word is missing, or is this misspelled, or are you missing an article? the or a and it will just come to the court's attention that you're trying to figure out whether this is just a, a typographical error or whether that's what the court intended now if you still have a copy of your instructions the court is just going to direct you to the bottom of page 52. <clears throat> And at the bottom of page 52, there is a paragraph that begins if you unanimously. And it uh, concludes on page 53. So what the court will ask you to do is just cross out that entire paragraph. And the court is going to read the substitute paragraph. And you will also get a copy of that substitute paragraph. So you do not have to take notes on the substitute paragraph. So instead of that last paragraph on the draft that the court gave you, this is how the last paragraph will read uh, at the bottom of page 52. Counts two and four, conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence. Now, as the court mentioned, the defendant is charged in counts two and four with conspiracy to commit tampering with physical evidence not the substantive offense of tampering with physical evidence. The court refers you back to previous instructions on the definitions of agreement and an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. In summary, therefore, the state must prove beyond a reasonable doubt, one, that the defendant had an agreement with Fotis Dulos to commit tampering with evidence, Two, the defendant or Fotis Dulos did an overt act in furtherance of the conspiracy. And three, the defendant specifically intended to enter into the agreement and intended the conduct constituting the crime of tampering with evidence. If you unanimously find that the state has proved beyond a reasonable doubt each of the elements of the crime of conspiracy to commit tampering with evidence, then you shall find the defendant guilty. On the other hand, if you unanimously find that the state has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt well, this says any of the elements, any one of the elements, you shall then find the defendant not guilty. So that last line should read, on the other hand, if you unanimously find that the state has failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt any one of the elements, you shall then find the defendant not guilty. This will be given to you. You can mark it up as you wish. Soon, the exhibits, all of the exhibits in the case are going to come to you. What also will come to you is a laptop. Uh, if you have any trouble with the laptop, uh, we can troubleshoot for you. So if you just retire to the liberation room, all of the exhibits will be brought in. And at that time when you are all in the deliberation room together, you can begin deliberating. You can retire to the deliberation room.
council have checked all of the exhibits? And yeah, yes, we have. And are they all there? <clears throat> they are, and we've separated out the ID ones, I believe. And uh, I also looked at the laptop, so I have no problems with that either. Thank you. So, uh, Madam Clerk, will get all of those exhibits into the jury room, and we'll stand in a recess. All rise. This Iowa Superior Court now stands in recess. Thank
So ladies and gentlemen, we conclude for today. You should have all of the exhibits in the deliberation room. The court understands you also want an easel that will be, but we'll try to fix that uh, sometime before you come in tomorrow. So when you come in tomorrow, we start at 10 o'clock. Court wants to make sure that everyone is here after you come into the courtroom and the lawyers stipulate that all of you are present and need to and just begin your deliberation. So again, do not be surprised. If the media tries to talk to you now, your names and your addresses have not been made available to the media, but their efforts to try to find out who you are will not go unabated. So please don't talk to the media, please. Don't discuss the case with anyone. Please follow no media reports about the case, and we hope to see you tomorrow. Have a good evening. They will stand adjourned until tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock. All right.